needs to be green. Okay. May I get a roll call, please? Thank you. Roll call. Ms. Baker? Here. Mr. Claybrook? Here. Mr. Jackson? Here. Mr. Melanger? Here. And Mr. Chairman? Here. We have a quorum. The Memphis and Shelby County Board of Adjustment is hereby, uh, or I'm sorry, is the oldest appointed governmental body in Memphis and Shelby County, established in 1925. The board hears appeals from the administration of the zoning ordinance, requests from variances from the zoning ordinance, and other requests as articulated by local zoning laws adopted pursuant to the enabling legislation. The eight members of the board are appointed, four by the mayor of Memphis and four by the mayor of Shelby County, uh, with confirmation by the Memphis City Council or the Shelby County Board of Commissioners. We serve without remuneration. At this time, I would like to swear in the staff. You may all remain seated. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, of God? All right, thank you. Uh, may I get a motion to approve the minutes from last month's meeting? Second. All right, is there any discussion of those minutes? Uh, Mr. Secretary, are you wanting to talk about the minutes? Okay, uh, if you'll come to the front then. Do you give your name and address for the record? And I'll swear you in. Hamilton, 4187 Sequoia Road, Memphis, 38117. Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, enough but the truth help you got? I do. All right, go ahead. And I, forgive me if I'm out of order and not done this before, but- We'll figure that out, so yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are requesting that item two be of the minutes from last week be pulled from the minutes due to an appeal of the uh, tree screen as one of the conditions from that decision. Mr. Whitehead, would that just be, a, does that need to be a petition for a rehearing? Uh, I, is number two from last month on William Arnold? Number two from last month would have been on 4048 Menden. Uh, there is a process for a rehearing, and the deadline for that process is seven days before this meeting. So you'll have to avail yourself to um, <coughs> the Tennessee Code Annotated that sure. deals with appeals of this body. I understand. I, I think I understand. Although Mr. Bacchus. Uh, had emailed me and recommended that I come and request item two pulled from the minutes. Uh, that's where I got my information from. And I hope I'm understanding and acting on it correctly. Yeah, I, d I don't think that's accurate. Correct, Josh? He'll need to file an appeal? Correct. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll need to file an appeal for that? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. All those in favor of approving last month's minutes, uh, please do so by saying aye. 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 Here, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Um, Mr. Secretary, if we have a secretary's report this month, please give it or and then explain the procedure for the meeting. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess the only comment I have on the secretary's report is uh, there's one key difference between the last time y'all were in this space and today, and that is we have new microphones. Well, mainly we have a new roof, but we also have new microphones, <laughs> and the microphone, you have to press the button at the Inter base button. of it uh, for the, the light to turn green, and that means you can speak and be heard. Thank you. Uh, procedurally... We will uh, conduct this meeting as follows. I'll introduce each case that is listed on the agenda. Agendas uh, are available on the lower right podium in the front of the room. For each case, staff with the Division of Planning and Development will, will give a presentation containing site plans, photographs, and maps of the subject property. At the conclusion of that presentation, the applicant will present his or her case. After that applicant's presentation time will come supporters. The applicant and the supporters have a cumulative uh, 10 minutes to provide testimony. That cumulative 10 minutes of testimony will be followed by the opposition, 
which uh, again will have 10 minutes total opposition uh, uh, testimony. Following those two 10, sec 10 minute sections of time, we will go to the applicant for a two minute rebuttal. These times do not include Q&A time from members of the board. We will toll the time for that. If the applicant wishes to uh, speak or if the board would like to speak after the conclusion of the public hearing, that is uh, possible. We'll get a two-thirds motion from the board, uh, two-thirds vote from the board to suspend the rules, to reopen the public hearing. Uh, but at that point, we will hear from both sides an equal amount of time. All motions made by the board will be made in the affirmative. The private acts governing this board require the affirmative vote of at least five members to approve any variance or appeal, regardless of the number of board members present. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will say the vice chair and Ms. Doss uh, do plan to attend, but until and unless they do, that does require a 100% vote with only five members on the dais. All section numbers that we are uh, referring to this afternoon come from the Memphis and Shelby County Unified Development Code, which was adopted by the city and the county in 2010. I will introduce the entire UDC and make it part of today's record, thus dispensing with the reading of the individual sections. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all applicants have been notified of this hearing, and all other notice requirements have been fulfilled according to the UDC. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. At this point, the board will establish a consent agenda. To establish the consent agenda, the secretary will, will call out each eligible case. If any member of the audience, staff, or board member objects to a case being placed on the consent agenda, he or she should do so by a show of hands when the secretary reads that case. Once the consent agenda is established, the board will vote on all cases placed on the consent agenda as a whole, will not hold individual hearings on those cases. Mr. Secretary, which items on our agenda are eligible to be placed on consent this week? Mr. Chairman, uh, very briefly, I am just making sure that we have all the notes, uh, the speaker's cards, so I don't call out any cases that we have a speaker's card on. Um, but if I don't have a speaker's card as of yet, as we go to the consent calendar, uh, and if you would like to hear the case, raise your hand. Uh, this is not only for those in the audience that are in opposition of a case, but also if you're an applicant and you have an issue with a condition of approval that is found in the staff report, you may also want to raise your hand. With that, uh, the consent calendar, the purpose of the consent calendar is to approve and dispense of all the uncontested cases at the beginning of the meeting, um, and we will vote on that in toto, and then following that, we'll have individual hearings on the cases that require such hearings. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, the first item eligible for the consent calendar is agenda item number one, which is docket BOA 202147, located at 230 excuse me, 263 North Hollywood. The applicant is we remodel. The use district is the R6 residential district and the request is a variance from subsection 361A to allow reduced side yard setbacks. Mr. Chairman, if you recall, we recommended rejection last month. Uh, the applicant and Mr. Baucus, uh, the, our project manager for this case, have gotten together uh, and found an accord and so we are now recommending approval. So unless a me member of the board would like to hear that, we can uh, place that on consent. Okay. Following you. item number one, we have item number three. Agenda item number three is docket BOA 2021-55, located at 612 North Highland. That's at the northeast corner of Highland and Sam Cooper. The applicant is High Point Hemp, represented by uh, Dentrius Gentry. And the use district is the MU mixed use district with the request being a variance from item 4915F1C to allow the reuse of a sign that is uh, too tall according to the code after it's been abandoned for 365 days. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. I'd like to discuss that okay. item. We'll hear number three. Item number five. Agenda item number five is docket BOA 2021-57, located at 528 Baltimore. The applicant is Jacobs Ladder, CDC, represented by Bill, Bill Marler. The use district is the RU1 multifamily district, and the request is a use variance to allow multifamily residential single senior housing. Okay. 
Mr. Whitehead? Yes. I'd like to discuss that item also. Okay, we'll hear number five. Uh, agenda item number six is docket BOA 2021-58, located at 1161 Homer. The applicant is Valentin Vahil. The use district is the RU1 multifamily district, and the request is a modification to docket BOA 2015-48 to allow a 958 square foot expansion of a restaurant. Okay. Item number seven. Docket BOA 2021-59, located at 1030 Nova Reese. The applicant is wearing Park Flats LLC. The use district is the CMU1 commercial district. And the request is a use variance to legitimize an existing multifamily apartment complex. Agenda item number eight, docket BOA 2021-61, located at 1360 Springbrook. The applicant is Bantam Holdings, excuse me, Bantam Apartment Holdings, LLC. The use district is the EMP Employment District, and the request is a variance from 4915 F1C to allow the reuse of a sign that has been abandoned for more than 365 days. Mr. Whitehead. Got it. <laughs> uh, can I... What was the item right before that? Because I thought that was one you were talking about, but maybe I asked to pull it off unnecessarily. Uh, the last one was on Baltimore. That's a multifamily senior housing. Okay, scratch that. Scratch that, got it. Number nine, we will hear. Number 10, agenda item 10 is docket BOA 2021-63, located at 1794 Linden. The applicants are Thomas E. and Susan B. Adams. The use district is the R6 Residential Overlay, Historic Overlay District, and the request is a variance from 361A to allow encroachments into the side <coughs> street and side interior setbacks. Agenda item number 11 is docket BOA 2021-64, located at 1655 Harbor. The applicant is Campbell Family Trust, represented by Charles Ship. The use district is R8, uh, residential single family in the historic overlay, and the request is a variance from paragraph 272B2 to allow an accessory structure to be three feet taller than permitted. We're going to hear number 12. We're going to hear number 13. That takes us to number 14, Mr. Chairman, which is docket BOA 2021-67, located at 272 South Danny Thomas. The applicant is Loeb Property Limited Partnership. The district is the SE Sports Entertainment and RSD South Downtown Residential Districts. And the request is a use variance from 721C2 and 722C2 to legitimize an existing gas station. And Mr. Chairman, if this is on consent, we do have a friendly condition. It is to... It's on a piece of paper that I don't have. Uh, Ms. Shoup Diggs, will you read into the record from that microphone? Mr. Chairman, this would strike existing, the existing sentence, second sentence of condition number two, and replace it with the following. So that would be, um, all other curb cuts shall be closed within three years of the date of this approval. Thank you. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. I, I'm not opposed to this item, number 15, but I would like to make a comment of it and, and on it and possibly um, just get a change in, in the way it's structured. We might need to push this one. I'm going to have to recuse myself from that particular case, and we need more people here anyway. So why don't we push that one back, and then we'll start with Mary's comments when we when we hear it, if that makes sense. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm not you opposed were just to it now. Yeah, yeah I'm not either. I just okay. I have to recuse so we don't have the votes to consent it, right it. now. Okay. So or I, or I told you to go ahead. Okay. And for clarity, we're talking about two different cases. Oh, I'm talking about four. I'm talking about 14. And she's talking about 15. I'm talking about 15, yeah. So okay. both are going to be heard, or at least in some brief format. Yes. And number 16 uh, is a petition for rehearing, so we'll hear that. So that concludes the consent agenda, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so I'm showing we on consent we have 1, 5, 6, 7, 10, and 11. We have a hand. Yes, sir, what case are you here? 
ma'am? Okay. Yes, what, what case? Number five, okay. Gotcha, thank you. And then in the, in the back, sir, we're different, okay. All right, so then that would make our consent agenda, Mr. Secretary, one, six, seven, 10, and 11. That's what I have. Okay, so is there a motion from the board to uh, uh, approve as conditioned by staff cases one, six, seven, 10, and 11? So moved. Second. Be moved and seconded. Uh, I don't think there's any discussion. So I'd remind the board that by voting on the consent agenda, he or she affirms that he or she has read the staff report and is in full agreement with the conditions. Mr. Secretary, may I get a roll call, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Baker? Yes. Mr. Claybrook? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Malazri? Yes. And Mr. Chairman? Yes. That's five eyes. All right, thank you. Uh, if you're here for cases 1, 6, 7, 10, or 11, you've been approved by staff, so thank you for coming down. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but you don't have to. Uh, with that, Mr. Secretary, would you call the first case on our regular agenda? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number two is docket BOA 2021-54. That's located at 3150 South Perkins at the northeast corner of Perkins and Knight Arnold. The applicants are Rafat and Talat Kumos, and the use district is the CMU2 Commercial Mixed Use District. The request is a Section 922-1 appeal of an administrative decision related to curb cuts. All right. Thank you. And we'll let the record show that Ms. Doss has joined us. Is the applicant here? All right, I see you. And is there any opposition to this case? Okay, very good. Mr. Skinner, will you give us like a real just brief overview of this one and then we'll go to the uh, applicant? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Seth Thomas, Office of Planning Development, the case for us. Mr. Bensley has to turn on his microphone. Is it on? Um, again, uh, Seth Thomas, Office of Planning yeah. Development, the case for us. It's uh, BOA 2154. Uh, it's at 3150 South Perkins. Um, an overview, again, um, really a appeal of a zoning decision. Uh, Administrator Josh Whitehead in consultation with the City of Memphis Traffic Engineer Ken Johnson to deny the appellant's request for replatting of the property in question to allow all four existing curb cuts to remain open. Um, location, uh, again, South Memphis. Um, here's an aerial photograph of the property as it exists right now, taken from Google Maps at the um, northeast corner of, of Nine Arnold and Perkins. Um, so originally, this site um, was originally a gas station part of the Parkway Community Village Center Plan, um, Z490. Uh, um, at, one, at, at one point in time, the, the site was converted into a car wash. Then it was subsequently purchased uh, by the appellant, who then demolished that car wash to rebuild the gas station, which of course had to go through a final platting process. Um, that final plat was approved in 2015 um, and with the signature of the property owner, as well as city engineering and zoning administrator, Mr. Whitehead. Um, uh, of course, these curb cuts were not closed. Um, here is a zoomed in uh, photo of where those unclosed curb cuts exist on the lot. Um, and um, the property owner received a courtesy type citation for the uh, failure to close those curb cuts and then subsequently install the landscaping that was supposed to be in those curb cuts place on December 11, 2021. Um, and then uh, traffic engineering, after you know requesting that they could replat the site to close the curb cuts, um, the, Mr. Whitehead, in consultation with traffic engineering, denied that request, which is why this appeal is before us today. Um, so basically, in conclusion, um, the owners of the subject property seek to amend the recorded plat of the Parkway Village Community Center SC1 phase plan phase nine to allow the property to keep the four existing curb cuts. Um, the appellant disputes the permits uh, conformance with UDC on two grounds. A, that the gas station across the street has four open curb cuts, and, and B, that the closing of the two curb cuts would negatively affect the profitability of the gas station. So really the board is going to be considering whether the property is permitted to record the replat or keep the curbs open. Um, so obviously staff recommendation is whatever action the board deems appropriate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, we'll move to the applicant. Unless there, well, are there any questions for Mr. Thomas right now? Being none. If you'll give your name and address for the record. 
Yes, I'm Lou Wardlaw with the law firm of Martin Tate Morrow and Marston, 6410 Poplar Avenue, Memphis, Tennessee, 38119. Uh, I represent uh, Rafat Kamus, who's here today, should there be any questions uh, by this body for him. Uh, this is an appeal to allow uh, simply a replatting of the property to allow the existing curb cuts to remain. It's a gas station that's located at 3150 South Perkins Road. There's another gas station across the street. Uh, there's a bank, I believe, of Walgreens. It's a commercial area. The property was originally built as a gas station. That building was demolished and replaced by a car wash. Mr. Camus here purchased the property, as, as staff has said, demolished the car wash, car wash and constructed a brand new state-of-the-art gas station in its place. Uh, the original curb cuts, the four of them, had remained there through all those changes and are there today. They haven't changed. They haven't changed since 1965. We're not asking for anything new. We're just asking to make the plat match what's there. These curb cuts have been there for decades. Uh, UDC 4.4.6 sub C provides that additional driveways may be considered by the zoning administrator in consultation with the city or county engineer as would be appropriate. Well, it's very difficult in this situation to run a, a successful gas station, not only profitably, but successfully at all, to compete and operate, uh, especially uh, when you have uh, one with four gas sta four driveways immediately across the street. It's, 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 it's not easily done, and we think it's impossible and suggest to this body that it would devastate the business. This is a busy intersection at Perkins and Knight Arnold, and again, this is what has existed uh, since before I was born. Uh, by way of example, like I've said, the Valero property across the street has a matching four driveways. The other properties have two and three driveways, respectively. Mr. Camus seeks administrative approval only to be allowed to keep uh, the property as it exists now with this four driveway configuration. Uh, we've been in consultation with Mr. Whitehead, and I've met with Mr. Thomas, and I appreciate both their times. Uh, we've made the ask that we'd be allowed to replat with all four. But as a last resort, and it would be a great hardship to my client, uh, he could uh, remove the South Perkins curb cut if it were absolutely necessary. Uh, he could consider changing also uh, the, the two curb cuts on each of the street faces to one larger curb cut on each of those. There's no limitation in the, on the, uh, in the uh, Unified Development Code on the width of uh, the curb cut. He could seek to replat that and still have the one allowed curb cut on each street, but at a wider width, essentially keeping up, making up the same space that he would have had, that he does have with the two. Uh, we'd really prefer it to stay the way it is and has been again since 1965, uh, but if this body wills it, he's willing to look at either of those other two and has offered up both of those other two suggestions. Either way would create room, uh, and Mr. Camus has made very clear that he'll landscape uh, in any manner that, that, that is reasonable uh, to staff. Uh, we're happy to present this matter to, to, to you folks today for the vote on it, or we're equally happy to go back and work with staff uh, on somehow relandscaping or extensively more relandscaping the existing four curb cuts or talking about removing uh, the South Perkins curb cut or talking about increasing the width and creating only two curb cuts, uh, but of a greater uh, width, probably totaling uh, the equal, the equaling the, the width that's out there now. Uh, so with that, I give it to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Mr. Camus is here, can answer uh, any questions if you have them, uh, but we submit it to, to you good folks just to leave uh, what's there alone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions from the board? Tim, I've got a question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Wardlaw, does, does your client currently have any access easements over the remainder of the property behind him? Well, um, that's difficult. He doesn't. Uh, he, th there's access... And this may be a fight at some point that we would hope to avoid. As you can see, I mean, can you pull up the original uh, platting of the original shopping center? It appears that there's a large flow through all the way through, but the driver, if I can get my bearings straight, uh, if that's the north, the, 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 the driveway to the north, north and what would be on the east side of, of my client's property 
that owner has put up what are temporary jersey barriers. He's just stacked them up, one after the other. And I won't get into it or denigrate a, a, a neighbor, uh, but he has given what is an exorbitant, uh, prohibitive price demand, saying I'll remove these jersey barriers, which we submit shouldn't be there anyway, but I'll consider removing them uh, at, at this exorbitant uh, rate. That's frankly a non-starter. Uh, so we are effectively cut off from this and whole. When if you just drive by quickly, Mr. Claver, it looks like it's a fully integrated uh, shopping center. In reality, and it doesn't take much of a close look at it, there are these jersey barriers that are put up that cannot be mistaken. They say you're not welcome here. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Is, uh, I, I got a quick question. Was so when it was replatted, I think they you know redid it because they were getting ready to build a nice new gas station. Was he aware of the need to close the curb cuts, or was that just kind of overlooked and it was on the plat and he didn't realize it? Well, there's two, there's two things. He signed it. There's no doubt sure. about that. We've been brought to environmental court as well, and uh, Mr. Kamu stood up and took his lumps and said, it, "It's signed." We're not denying that he signed it. Uh, it was signed without his being fully aware of what was going on and what's, what, what it meant and all that. But sure. there's no doubt that it, it's not a forgery. It, right, it, right, right, it, yeah. It's his signature. It's not quite uh, buyer's remorse, though. He didn't sign it and try to pull one over on the body order. He didn't understand, as someone who runs gas stations and doesn't do land use, he didn't understand what that meant. As I, I'll just say, to, if it helps at all with this body, we did go in... Uh, as one does when one is when one is brought into court on it and raise a hand and said we understand this is a problem we're going to try to do what's right and that's how we got to be to be here voluntarily not by order of the court okay uh any other questions from the board hearing none thank you for joining us thank you i'm available if you need me okay let me turn this off all right after hearing that are there any questions of staff before we move into discussion and Mr. Chairman, as you, as the board contemplates answering that question, I just wanted to let the board know we do have a special guest, uh, a staff member in attendance, and that's Terry Glover with the Traffic Engineering Division. Where is Ken Johnson, you may ask? Uh, since this uh, first started, he has retired. He's retired. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions of staff? Mr. Uh Madison, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I have a question for a um, gentleman from Traffic Engineering. It's my understanding that <clears throat> the reason why those curb cuts are being requested to be closed is because they pose a traffic hazard of safety. Is that correct? That is correct. Question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've not we've not moved to discussion yet. So yes, sir. And Sorry, I wasn't aware. I had thought that staff's presentation had had been done. So I appreciate you allowing me to come up. I know it's a little bit about a little bit out of order. Uh, Mr. Johnson, it's correct. He he has said this, and he he has said that it's uh, in his belief uh, did create a, a, a safety hazard. I asked for the specifics on that, and he and I would quibble over the language. Uh, I said, well, give me the dates and times of, of, of where you say it's, it's, it's a problem. And the answer was simply, go find that yourself. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it to you. I could read you the whole, uh, give and take on it, but we weren't provided that information. My client, uh, who runs this gas station there would submit on the record here, uh, that it is fully functioning, works very well, operational. Uh, he's only aware, I believe of one accident in the past, uh, um, two years, 18 months, that time frame. Uh, and again, we, we would say that we're simply keeping what is there since 1965, not asking to change anything. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Now looking at, I don't know when this was decimated. That, that, is that part of the staff report, Mr. Secretary? What's on the screen? Looks like there's the dates of the crashes there at the bottom of the second par paragraph. A uh, total of seven recorded crashes caused by two curb cuts. But just for that information, I don't know why that wasn't given or anything like that. If I uh, could, any other questions? May I speak to that? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I have some information. I don't have enough copies for everyone. Uh, this is from the Federal Highway Administration. 
Highway Administration. Mr. Glover, I, since we need this on the record, hold your comment and make sure Mr. Wardlaw has one. First, I have seen. <clears throat> Cut it off. Okay. Uh, I Googled this off the internet. It's out there for the public. It's wide open. It's some really good information about access management. The way it works is the federal government passes down a mandate for a state to set up a program for access management. TDOT has done that. Uh, the city of Memphis follows suit. Um, the city of Memphis also issues curb cut permits on state routes. But in this report, you'll find very specifically in the vicinity of intersections that these curb cuts are real safety hazards. It's kind of a uh, quick down and dirty, but it illustrates what we're dealing with here. Now, the reason the UDC is worded the way that it is and the curb cuts are up to the approval of the city engineer is so that we can work with property owners to find a way to give them access to their property. And we can do it in various ways, especially when they're hung on a corner like this property here. There are multiple violations with these uh, curb cuts that are here. Um, we can do write-ins, we can do write-outs, we can do write-in write-outs. We can delete curb cuts, and that's what we're doing in this situation. Here, right now the UDC requires that a curb cut be exactly 300 feet from the center of the intersection to the center of the first curb cut. Well, the first curb cut here is about 60 feet from the intersection, so we're way under the amount. Now, I get about a half a dozen of these a month. Same argument. Um, what we do, we're not picking on Mr. Comos out here. Um, we wait until they tear up, wait until they come in to pull a permit for a curb cut to replace it. And that's when we pick them up instead of going out and actively, you know, picking out people indiscriminately. So this happens very often. Like I said, I, I get a half a dozen of these a month. So when you vote on this, you better think about that because if you approve this one, the others are going to follow suit. Okay. Any questions of the board? I got a question, uh, Mr. Secretary. If we, if let's say we, um, vote no on this and Mr. Uh, the applicant has said they'll be happy to work to staff to maybe reconfigure that. That's still available to them by our no vote, right? We don't have to vote in some way to allow them to come back to you to be able to modify the curb cuts or do landscaping. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. So if, if this body rejects the appeal, uh, we'd go back to the recorded plat, which states the inner two curb cuts shall be closed. Now, uh, it is uh, the, uh, the decision that was made that was appealed is you can amend a plat without having to go through the whole process mm -hmm. back to the Land Use Control Board or to the City Council. Staff does have the ability to amend, to some degree, plats. And so that was the decision being appealed. So what we would do is we'd cons he would present to us uh, either a plat that shows those too closed or some hybrid model, at which case we would forward that to traffic engineer and the traffic engineer would say yay or nay. Um, so that, that would probably be the likely gotcha. situation if this body voted no. So a no vote would just reject the two as they are and then there's still opportunity to figure out what he needs to figure out like he offered to do. Correct. Okay. And, and Thank since you. I have the floor, uh, since th this is an appeal largely of the traffic engineer's uh, core decision, I think what we just did was we heard from the applicant, we heard from the opposition, so we probably ought to go back to the applicant, the appellant, okay. for a rebuttal period, just sure. to keep in line with our procedures. Yeah, come on up, Mr. Woodlock. Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rainey. Again, we, we hope that you uh, approve it and allow what's there. If not, and as Mr. Whitehead has, uh, has indicated, uh, we'd be asking for one of the other th things that we've frankly already suggested, uh, that either uh, one of the, the, the South Perkins uh, curb cut be removed, uh, leaving the three curb cuts, or uh, the, while the UDC does allow the engineer to chime in on the number of curb cuts, it is absolutely silent on the width 
of the curb cuts. We can come back with reconfigured with two curb cuts that are wider. Uh, I'll tell you that one way or the other, uh, we are reporting, the, the applicant and I are reporting to environmental court uh, this Monday, and we'll report whatever happens here today and whatever is going on. Uh, however this body decides, whatever the court decides, it's an open book test. We're not trying to hide the ball. We're going to go to them. Uh, I'm going to be in New York City. I'm flying back at some ridiculous time in the morning so I can make it to court uh, uh, this Monday. So it's an open book test. Uh, we're, 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 we're trying to play nice and we're trying to get it done, but we're also trying to follow what the UDC says. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any questions? All right. This, can we get a motion? to approve agenda item number two. So moved. Uh, is second. there a second? Moved and second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, yeah, Mr. Jackson? Just to my fellow board members, <clears throat> in looking at this, it is crystal clear that those curb cuts are too many, too close. And I think traffic engineering in the city of Memphis is spot on point. That Two of those four need to be removed, one off of Perkins and one off Night On. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Other thoughts? Hearing none, I assume you're ready to vote. Mr. Whitehead, will you give us a roll call vote, please? Ms. Baker? No. Mr. Claybrook? No. Ms. Doss? No. Mr. Jackson? No. Mr. Malazari? No. And Mr. Chairman? No. We have six nays. All right, the motion fails, but good luck as you continue to work through this issue. Thank you for coming down. Thank you, and as always, we, we thank you for your time, and, and I personally am so glad to be back uh, doing these things live. It's great. Right, thank you, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, will you call the next case for us, please? That brings us to agenda item number three, which is docket BOA 2021-55, located at 612 North Highland. The applicant is High Point Hemp. The use district is the MU Mixed Use District, and the variance is from 4915F1C to allow the reuse of a sign that's been abandoned for 365 days. Okay, thank you. Is the applicant present? Okay. Is there any opposition to this case? All right. If staff would just give a brief report. I know the, the board pulled it off, and maybe we have questions for you on it. Okay. Um, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, this is case BOA 210055. Applicant is Demetrius Gentry, High Point Hemp. Address is 612 North Highland. The request is for a variance from item 4.9.15F1C to allow the reuse of a sign at this location that has been abandoned for more than 365 days and to keep the existing height of 29 feet. Here's a location map showing um, where the um, sign is located. If you look at the vicinity map, it's located on the corner of the exit at Sam Cooper Boulevard and North Highland. There's a zoning map showing the diff different zonings. Uh, this one is in a CMU 3. And this is your land use map. Here's a couple of photos showing exactly where the sign is sitting. Uh, did a close-up to kind of give you an idea of what the sign looks like. Um, this is the proposed sign from the applicant, what they're going to put there. I have requested for them to do an integrated sign there. Here's their certificate of occupancy, allowing for their um, business there at this particular location. Um, this is a resolution where this uh, particular site is exempted because it predates the resolution which was done on February 16, 2021. Uh, these are the conclusions the applicant is seeking relief from this uh, section 4.9.15 F1C of the Unified Development Code to allow the reuse of a sign at 612 North Highland that has been abandoned for more than 365 days and to keep its existing height. Uh, since the sign has been abandoned for more than 365 days, there will, there will be no change in use. The sign can keep its existing height. Though the proposed project conflicts with the section of the sign code, which allows additional height when near an interstate highway, according to the UDC section 4.9.7D, Table 1, staff feels that this site, a pro proximity and expressway, allows the sign to remain the height 
that it is and warrants the approval. The granting of the variance will not cause substantial detriment to the public good, nor will it substantially impair the intent and purpose for an adopted plan or, or the code, nor will it be injurious to the neighborhood or to the general welfare, and it will be, harm, will be harmony with the purpose and intent of the development code. Also be reminded on February 16, 2021, the Memphis City Council approved the resolution requesting a 273 day moratorium on the issuance of permits for tobacco shops, hair shops, smoke shops, and vape shops. You can see page 12 of the full resolution for the full resolution. Uh, staff recommends approval with conditions as follows. Any questions for me? I am here. Are there any questions of staff? Um, Mr. Baker. Chairman, yes. I, I do have some questions. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, my first question is um, regarding the height that's permitted and what is the height currently? Uh, because I think the height permitted is 25 feet. It is. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. And in the staff report, you say it's 29 feet, but then in the application, it says it's 35 feet. And uh, so I'm wondering first, uh, just how tall is this okay. sign? That was based on the citation, I believe, that was given to the applicant or to the owner, whoever was at this property, that that was written. And I do apologize because uh, I didn't include it. And I guess I should have from Miss Felicia Smith. She uh, put it in there. It was. Um, Put in there that it was 29 feet. Uh, the person that written the, the citation for the sign. So I just used that from. So that it's actually 35 feet. You think existing the I'm sign? Sorry, the existing sign is 35. Is that correct? I'm going on what they the staff said in um, codes it was 29. Oh, but but we don't know for sure. I but guess. we don't know for sure. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yeah, we. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Let me. That's the app. We'll get we'll get some we'll get some information from you then yeah. once I swear you in. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Keep going? Go ahead. Proceed. Okay. Uh, I, I'm probably going to vote against this, uh, but when I look at the conditions uh, that are attached in your staff report recommendation, mm -hmm. one of them is that you require it to be an integrated center sign. And uh, when I look at the requirements for integrated center sign, it allows 35 feet. So uh, I'm wondering if this variance is even needed. Well, that was a recommendation from Ms. Smith in codes and the sign codes department to do have them to do an integrated sign because there were other businesses there. So that's why I put that in there. Okay, uh, I have one other question. Or is this sign, this might end up being a question for the applicant, uh, I, I can't tell whether this sign is oriented to the interstate or if it's inter oriented to Highland. So because there's a lot of talk about, uh, about um, being seen from the interstate. Uh, it's right at the corner of the little exit. Um, I think it's exit 90, what is that? I don't even know what the expressway exit, but there's an exit there right at Sam Cooper. So it sits like in the corner. You can actually probably see it from Sam Cooper Boulevard. I think that it sits to where the sign itself is perpendicular. You can see it, yeah. it, 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 it from it. Not perpendicular yeah. to Highland. Right. So yeah. it's that oh. raised road that it's trying to get to. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, I, I guess the thing for me to do at this time is wait and hear from the applicant sure. okay. and so on. And right. maybe speak later. Is absolutely, okay. absolutely. Are there any other questions of staff at this time? All right, uh, Ms. are you Mr. Gentry? All right, come on down and speak with us. And if you'll give your name and address for the record and I'll swear you in. And if you, you don't have to, if you want to take your mask off while you're speaking, that's fine, it's up Thank to you. you. My name is Demetrius Gentry. The address I'm speaking of is 612 North Highland Street. Okay, Memphis, Tennessee, you, 38117. All right. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of yes, God? Sir. All right, go ahead, sir. You can speak to us. So the property is located on the corner of Summer and Holland. The signage is facing the freeway. So if you are coming from uh, Sam Cooper, whether you're going up or down, I have video footage of a drone coming up both locations showing, showing that you can see that sign. 
there are some trees kind of blocking it. So unfortunately, if you look in that same picture there, you can see it as well. Um, from the record that we received from the sign company, it was ranged between 29 and 32 feet. It was kind of windy the day that they measured it. And there are other tenants inside the, the bays that we have, which are three other tenants. And we have a space on that sign underneath the two locations that we have at the lower sign where we will have space for them to be able to put signage there as well. Okay. Yes, sir. Is there any other questions for me? Uh, Ms. Baker, do you have any questions? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any, does anyone else on the board have a question for the applicant? Uh, yeah, Mr. Jackson. Sir, are there any other signs on Summer or Highland of a lower height that identify that strip sign? Not to my knowledge. Any other questions? Can you ask that question one more time? Is there any other signs no. on? Are there other signs not on the building okay. that would identify that center? Like no, so sorry. down Highland or on Summer that are pointing to you. That's, yes, that's kind of your one off building sign. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a slightly different question from yes, Mr. Sir. Jackson? Yes, sir. Are there any other uh, pole signs or uh, signs not attached to the building that advertise any of the other tenants in the building? On this corner of Summer and Holland, on the other corner, um, there's, a, there's a sign for Valero, which is across the street, and there's a sign for Sitco. I'm trying to determine, uh, I I'm going where Ms. Baker is going. If this is a sign along a controlled access road, the sign code doesn't say interstate highway. It says controlled access road, which you know, Been the, the ladder right does include Sam Cooper. It allows a height of 30, 35 feet. So I'm trying to determine why Ms. Campbell determined this was a non-conforming sign that could not be reused if abandoned after 365 days. And it seems like we don't have an answer to that. Uh, I guess, Ms. Shelton, you're going to a Google Street image? Yes, sir. I'm trying to get there. Because if there's another ground sign, then that, regardless of height, would be a reason that it's uh, nonconforming. Right. The other sign. That's our sign. Mm -hmm. No. No, that's the sign there. So if you go to the corner. Right there. Oops, sorry. Did I go too far? I don't give a scared a little bit. Yeah. Just turn a little bit more. Right there, you see the Sitco. So there's the. And they have that sign is just for Sitco. Mm -hmm. No. You need me to go further? That's why I So then the question is the, the Sitco building is attached and perhaps is on the same parcel as. Could you go to the. Registers website. Okay. Okay. Now we need to determine if the shopping center is the same parcel as the Sitco. What what's the address? Six twelve is a different parcel. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, Mr. Smith, are you in the room? Can you approach the podium? What are we uh, looking for on the registers website? And Mr. Smith, if you'll give your name and address for the record. Well, I've already, were you sworn in earlier with the rest That's of staff? staff? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead and uh, talk to Mr. Smith, do you recall the reasoning behind um, the zoning enforcement's finding that this was a non conforming sign? Uh, no, I do not. Well, let's assume it was height, because the height was the sure. one flag, the height was the thing flagged on the citation. Um, so now we're back to where Ms. Baker asked the question, is this variance even necessary? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Whitehead, I, I, I just, I have another question for you. Uh, I, I, of course, it sent me to the UDC uh, to look to see what is the definition of integrated center sign. And uh, to me, it looked like he only really had to have two businesses on the sign to be integrated center. So it's not a big hurdle just to make it an integrated center sign. And then it conforms. Right. And maybe make some money off of one of your fellow tenants. 
because the integrated center sign has two tenants on it. It has to sure. be okay. at least two. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're, at a, we're at a crossroads. Do we go ahead and there could be a million reasons why a sign is non-conforming. So we could reject this and assume that it's a, a buy right sign that can rock and roll. But that's a, there's a risk in that, and that is maybe it's too close to the property line, all right? Uh, maybe it doesn't have enough landscape bedding around it. Uh, Ms. Shelton, are you aware of any of these? Uh, there's some landscaping there, but he's going to redo the landscaping. So, okay. and that's included, I think, in my conditions. So he's going to he's going to redo that. So that's where we are, Mr. Chairman. The posture is. Um, if we if if the board does want to see the reuse of that sign regardless and have it all buttoned up uh, vote yes if you'd rather just make it adhere to the code whatever that entails then vote no okay which it may or may not actually be right in right, its right. present form what the, Ms. Doss? The yes vote is what? The yes vote would be to bless the sign as it is, mm -hmm. to be the height that it is, and have one, you know, one business. Mm -hmm. Now, he plans to put another business on there. If he ever did that, we think it would be a conforming sign and not need a variance. But for mm -hmm. one business, he needs us to vote. Very and I think the, the, what staff would say is, given the height, because, uh, well, let me ask a question real quick so I understand it. A, because it's along an expressway, that height would be allowed? A controlled access road. Controlled access road. Yeah, up to 35 feet. Now, one question we don't know, I bought codes a heightometer at one point that may or may not still be in their Code grasp. Box. Yeah. <laughs> but we have a heightometer that uh, Mr. Pence has actually helped me measure. Uh, and it, and the, 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 the height of a sign is measured at the ground. So this ground, it looks like, is a little higher than the building, right? Sure. Uh, maybe three feet. But you measure it from the base of the ground to the tippy top of the, uh, uh, of the sign, and maybe Mr. Smith knows whether we use that heightometer. We yeah, still have that device. I put a battery in it about two weeks ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not that accurate. So we were still using the pole that goes to... 40 feet. So we feel comfortable that it's 29 feet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yes, Chairman, I, I just want to say one other thing about this. I mean, I, I'm glad that there is a way out of this so that it can be integrated center sign and then, you know, he can use the sign. But at the same time, I, I also feel like, um, and I've said this before, uh, the way the sign ordinance is, is if you're not careful, you can uh, get into this pattern of adopting variations to it. And uh, what happens when you do that is you, there's no change. The streets stay looking pretty much like they do. And uh, I just think that um, even though the 3.0 plan doesn't specifically say anything about signs in this area, it, it does talk about making the streets more attractive pedestrian areas. And I think enforcing the sign ordinance, you know, is is part of that. And so that's how I look at it. And so I, I, I'd i rather just vote no on this and let him do what he can do under the ordinance. Uh, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Secretary, I have a question also. Tell, if you could, tell us how the Summer Avenue Overlay District affects this. That is a good question. So, uh, it, it, but the nomenclature you just slightly off. So, and this will come up on another case. Uh, the City Council uh, several months ago approved a ordinance that downzoned many properties along Summer, this being one of them from one of our commercial mixed-use districts to the MU mixed-use district. And I don't think the, the answer to, so the MU district historically was located in one part of town, Uptown. And in fact, that's where you find uh, the, uh, 
the language regarding the MU district is in, is in the uptown section of the code. Um, so the sign code states, signs located in the uptown district uh, shall be subject to the provision of the Memphis City Code 1232-1. That's our DRB, uh, Design Review Board, section of the city code. That, that's the Downtown Memphis Commission, right? It's a much stricter sign code. But the key language here is signs located in the uptown district. So while we're in a zoning district typically associated with uptown, we are not in the uptown district. So I would argue uh, the regular sign code, the one that we've been discussing all this time, is the one that applies. But Thank that's you. a great question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Jackson, go Just, ahead. We're not in discussion yet, are we? We're not. No, no. I'm sorry. I have no further Okay. Um, is there any other questions for staff for the applicant? And just real quick, I want to make sure there's no uh, opposition here for this case. I didn't see any. All right, then uh, if somebody could give a motion to approve, um, I didn't. I don't have the staff report in front of me. What is it? BOA 2021-55, as conditioned by staff. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, be a minute second. I assume you're ready to discuss. Mr. Jackson, do you have something you'd like to say? Yes, sir. Um, I agree with Ms. Baker in her observation of where the whole city is with signage. And to go a step further, if, if, I, if I understand correctly, one of the reasons why they're here for, we're hearing this case, is because the sign has been vacant for over 365 days. And one way we as a board can help enforce the signage ordinance and get to a more pedestrian-oriented environment within our city with regards to signage is when signs have been vacant that long not to approve them to be put back in use. And I'm all for not doing this for that specific reason. Um, if there's another variance that comes along from the applicant that says, I want to have a sign that is more pedestrian oriented than this one, I agree. If this was on I-55 or I-240, I'd probably be inclined to vote for it. But where it is on Sam Cooper makes this particular strip center it's more of a destination point to me than it is an impulse stop and buy. And for that reason, I think I'm going to vote no. Okay. Other thoughts of the board? Hearing none, Mr. Whitehead, can you give us a roll call, please? Mr. Malazri? No. Mr. Jackson? No. Ms. Doss? No. Mr. Claybrook? No. Ms. Baker? No. Mr. Chairman? Uh, no. Six but, nays. Uh, thank you for coming down. Hopefully, in our discussion, you see a path forward uh, by making this a strip you, center sign. So it was an easier one probably for us to be able to vote no for as we try to enforce the code. So, so. what your recommendation is is that it would be more of an impulse type sign to help with? No, the recommendation is if it's a strip center sign, it sounds like it might be a approved sign as it is. So what do I need to show all the graphics for all the other companies on there? Is that um, all? That would be, I, I don't know that you would even need to come back to us to do a strip center sign, Mr. Whitehead. Ms. Shelton will get with you. And, all right, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for coming down. Mr. Whitehead, will you uh, call the next case for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number four is docket BOA 2021-56, located at 921 South Yates. The applicant is Loeb Realty, represented by Ciara Neal. And the use district is the CMU-1 Commercial Mixed Use District, with the request being a variance from item 4915F1C, uh, a frequent item uh, that is subject to request this afternoon, right. to allow the reuse <laughs> of a sign that has been abandoned for more than 365 days. Okay, is the applicant here? Okay, thank you. Uh, would you like to give us a brief report of this one as well? Uh, if you'd like me to, sir, yes, it'll be the same. It'll be the, it'll be the same. <laughs> uh, if you want, uh, yeah, if, 
we if the board doesn't want we can forego the staff report and go straight to the applicant if we would like okay if the applicant and I'll would give come you the, the rundown so the nonconformity here is much easier it's that we have more than one ground mounted sign in front of the building mm -hmm. okay so that's the issue yeah if the uh, applicant will come forward and is there any uh, there's no opposition to this case I think okay all right thank you if you'll give your name and address for the record my name is Kira Neal our address is 5264 Poplar Avenue 38119 all right, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth stuff you got? I do. All right, go ahead. So this sign has been in use continually since 1968, which is 53 years. It is, uh, we're not applying for any kind of change in the structure whatsoever. Uh, this is visible from the Poplar Avenue commercial corridor. And on the other side of this sign, if you were standing facing this shopping center, behind you would be Memorial Park Cemetery. Uh, it's not visible by any residences, and it is right off of Poplar. If you just look to the left, you'd see the new Renaissance Bank headquarters coming up on the side. So it's a very commercial area. Uh, this has remained vacant for about 10 days over that 365-day limit because of some issues we were having associated with COVID, obviously. Uh, that was from March to March, March 2020 to March 2021. Uh, we are in agreement with the recommended conditions that the OPD has presented to us, and we look forward to having Mr. Meller, who's our incoming tenant, uh, be able to advertise Hogwild Barbecue there. Okay, are there any questions of the applicant? Uh, no. Um, I got a question. Sure. Um, you said, we just rejected one that was similar because it went 365 days. Could you just try to distinguish yourself from there? Absolutely. That sign is quite tall. It's 32 to 35 feet, depending on how that ends up being measured. Uh, this one is 19 feet. As I mentioned, it's been there since 1968. It's never had any objections. It's never had any issues with the neighbors. If you could go back to that site plan, please, you'll see that it's right there. It's well lit. It's well maintained. Uh, and it does not affect negatively the streetscape in that area. It's absolutely not as visible, but it is visible from Poplar Avenue, which is an extremely important facet of advertising for the tenants who work there. Uh, Mr. Meller is the former head of the Memphis Restaurant Association. He has multiple locations, but it's important for them to be able to be visible to Poplar Avenue traffic without impacting the nearby residences at all. Okay. Mr. Jackson. I'm sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. Could you restate what the um, use of that sign would be name-wise? Like, is it restaurant or what is that? It would have the logo of Hogwild Barbecue on it. I'm sorry. Say it again. It would have the logo of Hogwild Barbecue on it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Whitehead or staff. So let's say we reject the sign. What is there, you know, there's already a couple signs there that are in use. What are they allowed to do? If they can't have this sign, like what should, what does the code tell us we should do for a business like that? So a shopping center is allowed one of two singular ground mounted signs per frontage. So a setting like this, one frontage, one sign. You can do an integrated center sign which allows for maybe a little extra height than your second option, which would be one of the tenants, the tenant who's been there longest, maybe the tenant who's the favoritist, or maybe just the random tenant who did not vacate their space for 365 days is the one tenant. Mm -hmm. So those, those, that's where we would go from here. So this shopping center currently has four tenants they're all long-term tenants. The, you all would know them, Buckley's Lunchbox. They're all local tenants. And because the signs have been there for so long, uh, there is not currently a pylon sign that lists everyone. Uh, but to do so would mean to erect a much larger sign than currently exists on site. Um, Since I'll, yes, I, I wouldn't want to play for it. I have a question. Sure. Uh, I got a little bit confused about this when I was looking at the staff report. I did notice what Mr. Whitehead pointed out, that two signs looked like they were too close together. 
uh, and I don't think there's any landscaping at the bottom. Uh, but I, I couldn't tell uh, by the staff report whether there's a height uh, violation or not. Um, is there a height violation as well? I mean, what are we voting to <laughs> to vary, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, the, the main variance would be uh, multiple ground signs on a singular site. Uh, but one other variance, if we can zoom in, is going to be the fact that this sign does not have a landscape base. Then another variance would be it's not far enough from the back of the sidewalk. I believe it's right at the sidewalk. I was trying to get a street to you, so you uh, it's a little it. bit far behind where you are right now. There you go. There it is. Height, I don't think. Uh, I think you're allowed up to 25 feet, so height would be the the one this is variance is not necessary. And you can see what a benefit that is to those local tenants since they're able to advertise their businesses to Poplar Avenue. And you I, can also see that landscaping between them and that residential area that is beyond. It's actually quite a quiet little center. Mr. Chairman, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. What is that sign there with the cube thing at the bottom? It almost looks like it's an off-premise sign, a small one. This one? At the corner, no. Of course, there. What is that? Is that a third sign on this property? It's one of the signs. It's like four. I think I counted four signs on this property. It's one here, 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 and here. It's a what now? I'm having trouble hearing. No, I'm sorry. It's uh, four signs on this property. Uh, what we counted is this one that you're looking at, that you're questioning. Um, this one, the bump, I'm assuming that's what that says. The pizza, and then this one, I don't know what's on the other side of that particular sign. That's Buckley's lunchbox. And the one that's hard to see, that's uh, the shirt place. There's just something weird going oh, on that with shirt? that picture. Is that what that is? Well, so uh, I guess, uh, I mean, we approve this. It's it's going to be pretty much the way it's going to stay. I mean, there would never be any reason to change it then. If, if we say yes, it, it's, it, it won't come back, I don't think. I don't know. I don't want to push my luck. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions of staff or the applicant? Yeah, if you'd like to come speak, um, just give your name and address for the record, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name is Ernie Meller. My business address is 1291 Tully Street, Memphis 3817. Uh, we are the new. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of a yacht? I do. All right, go ahead, sir. Uh, we are the new tenant with uh, low properties at 921 South Yates. One of the reasons we went in there was the close proximity to Poplar Avenue and the potential use of that sign. Uh, as uh, Ms. Neal mentioned, I am the recent past president of the Memphis Restaurant Association. Last year was pure hell. Uh, I'm also on the state hospitality board and Memphis tourism board. Um, our industry as a whole has been flattened. I was off 70% last year. I've rolled the dice in trying to open this little takeout and to go and carry out grab and go uh, new concept that we you know just to survive uh, our business is coming back but now we've got the same issues that everybody else in every industry across the nation and around the world nobody wants to work uh, and I need every ounce of help from this city to make my business work and that sign is a piece of that and I would appreciate y'all's vote in a positive manner Was the, uh, let me ask you, was there any specific issue with COVID or just things got delayed because of COVID? Like, was it there was some delay due to COVID? Yeah. Multiple factors. Uh, multiple factors. I think we all know what those are. Uh, we've all been a little delayed. But normally that's not something that would have happened. Right. Um, any other questions of the applicant or staff? All right. Thank you all. Again, I'm going to ask if there's any opposition. Seeing none, I assume you guys are ready to discuss. If I could get a motion to approve BOA 2021-56. So moved. 
there any condition? I mean, sorry, any uh, second, please. Second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Here, uh, use your microphone. Essentially, they're saying the reason it wasn't applied for on time or the lease was handled on time is because of the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. And it was ten. It was ten days late. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't I see this as a little different than the other one. Yeah. I think generally Loeb is on top of the ball on their signage, leases, everything. I think we've dealt with plenty of their stuff. Is I mean, I I deal with it personally in business. So. The other sign's been abandoned for a long, long time. Ms. Baker? Well, I guess what I was going to uh, suggest is uh, I, I would feel better about approving this if I thought we were going to see it again and we might have an opportunity uh, for things to get better over time, uh, you know, rather than just the four signs um, too close to the sidewalk no landscaping and so on um, because I you know I'm sympathetic to the conditions of us just coming starting to come out from the pandemic and everything but but uh, it still troubles me that once we approve it uh, mr. Whitehead would would it approve all those other signs if we approve this one would would we in effect be approving the others no, because only this sign is the subject of your action. Um, but we could go ahead and make that a condition. Lock it down with a condition. So let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Whitehead. So if we approve this, it's then a legal sign as it is. So let's say that that, heaven forbid, something happens, that space goes empty in 10 years for two years. They can that sign is still good, it, or do we still have our 365 days that would trigger coming back here again? No, what you would be doing is mm -hmm. um, blessing that sign that's on forever. forevermore, right? Unless we added a condition on that, correct? Okay. I'm going to put Miss Baker on the spot because I know her love of signs. Uh, would you have a suggestion, Miss Baker, for a condition you would want to add? Well, I, I would like Thoughts? to add the condition that um, uh, Mr. Whitehead suggested that um, we are not approving, or our vote applies only to the one sign that's before us and does not approve any of the other signs uh, that are there in front of the center. Um, I mean, uh, it, can we just say also, uh, it, it remains a non-conforming sign. And uh, how about um, how about that? In the event the sign is not used for 365 days, that's it would fine. the variance would lapse or something prettier than that, Mr. Whitehead. That I'm sure do you we can do figure that? out. I bet we can. <laughs> uh, well, the the UDC and the enabling legislation allows. Uh, any condition, it, it's pretty open. Any condition that uh, has a semblance of, um, you know, in, enforcing the code and enforcing the intent of the code is permissible. So on uh, the 365 days, we would add a new condition number three. I'm on page uh, 13 of the staff report. A new condition three that would read, um, if vacated, after, uh, if vacated for more than 365 days, UDC section 4915F, et cetera, would apply. And then the other condition would be at the, in the, in the body of existing condition number two, where it reads, a variance shall be allowed for one detached pole sign to remain in size, location, and design. We would uh, add the words after detached pole sign uh, maybe the detached pole sign that advertises, uh, I think it's the, the third from the north, uh, from the south. Yeah. Well, yeah. Third. Correct, yeah. And we could even it, it, it further expound that once uh, advertised Garibaldi's and under this application will advertise Gone Wild. And so then our future people a thousand years from now can try to glean which sign we're talking about. 
But it wouldn't it be show, couldn't you show that on a site plan? I mean, is there not a site plan that goes uh, with these? Would be required uh, if we. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm loud anyway, but they would be required to show that on the final plan if you wanted that shown. If you're adding these conditions that you're trying to add, then yes, I'm going to require them to show it or to have that on there. Do you so mind, when it's recorded, I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna, do you mind putting up staff's conditions again? I know sure. we went to the internet for some stuff, so. No, it, it's okay, no problem. And so what you're saying is that part of doing this is they're gonna have to give us a site plan? because of condition number one. Okay. So it could be indicated on the site plan, the yes, particular sign that we're- Yes, ma'am. Okay. Approving for, unless it is vacant for 365 days. Yes. Right. Okay, other discussion? Uh, Mr. Jackson. You know, as I look at this case and I think about the previous case we had, you know, I don't see a great difference in it. In fact, I see four signs on one site that by today's standards are non-conforming. And Ms. Baker, you said something earlier that just hit home with me. The opportunity to be able to clean that up may not avail itself again. I sympathize with everybody when it comes to the COVID situation and what has taken place. But in good conscience, I can't vote yes for this sign to be brought into conformance. Just uh, talking to board members and not talking to the applicant or owners, I'm, I would much rather see us reject it, allow them to come back with one sign that may even require a variance that would incorporate it all into one sign and get a variance that listed everybody there, as opposed to having four signs there as it exists now. And I'm very familiar with the location. I bank, the bank right on the corner. I see it all the time. So that's just my opinion of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other thoughts? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And this may be a question for Mary. Um, I mean, is there a way that we can do a condition that will allow this sign, but in the event that the other three become non-conforming, it, it would encourage to consolidate the signs on here? On particular site, do you have any ideas on that? And so, to Mr. Jackson's point, it will eventually get there, but maybe not all happen today, right now. But what about a sunset? Well, that's what I was initially thinking. We just put a, you know, one year sunset on it, and give them some chance to get in the saddle and get over the. Just a, a, a thought, but. Okay, any other thoughts on a possible sunset with the uh, length of time for it or anything like that? Mary suggested one year. So Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, please. So Mr. Speaker, are you saying that this particular one sign would have a sunset on it? Or are you saying that we will grant approval of this sign for one year, and within that one year they can come back and incorporate it all into one sign? What are we specifically saying? Uh, or well, ask them to do that. The, and that really uh, goes to Mr. Malazri's um, trying to tie the two together. Um, yeah, or, or it could just. Uh, limit our approval to one year and um, after that the sign ordinance applies and they can do what they can do in accordance with the ordinance. That's I mean that's really to me what we're trying to get to is to as much as possible uh, avoid varying the ordinance because like you say everything stays the same. Four signs with no setback and no landscaping and so forth. Um, so, 
but you know, I'm I'm willing to go along with whatever board members think is fair and right. Uh, let me ask you: We only have any sort of power, like all these signs. Having having four signs for this strip center is a legal non-conforming thing if all those businesses had stayed in use. We're here for the one sign, which we can adjust, but it has we can't by what we're doing isn't affecting any of those other signs. Really the only option besides for this, it, to go with the sign code, this basically the landlord would need to just build a sign for all four of them because this guy would just lose his sign, but everybody else can leave theirs. So it's either the landlord getting together to make it work or no sign. That, that's a good summary. The other signs are protected nonconformities because they haven't gone that 365 days of vacation. So how do we fashion all of that into one or possibly two conditions? How does that, how do we, how do we meet in the middle? Well, it seems like there's two diverging attempts to meet in the middle. One was the added two conditions, well, the added one condition and an amendment to an existing condition, talking about vacation, uh, that uh, if it ever vacates for 365 days, it shall, uh, essentially the variance goes away. And to um, notate that we are only talking about this sign. So that's one approach to a middle ground. The other, maybe more stricter approach to the middle ground is this variance only lasts 365 days, at which point Hog Wild has uh, no ground sign or Hog Wild gets with Loeb uh, in maybe an effort to keep its one tenant, but also in an effort to not uh, lose its other three tenants. I mean, there's going to be a lot of herding of cats under uh, the more strict middle ground. And, but that's, that's not this body's problem, right? Uh, it, th those are the two middle grounds uh, that have been articulated. Okay. Can I ask, uh, would the board allow me to ask the business owner a quick question? Okay. If you'll come, if you'll come up real quick, sir. I'm just curious how long your lease is for, if you don't mind giving us the term. We did a pop-up solution. So I've got a short-term rental. And I have to let them, with a long-term five-year lease on the back side of it. So at the, um, at the, the October 31st, I'm do or die. Of course, I have to give uh, the landlord 60 days notice. Sure. So we're in that we're in that process. So 60 days would be before September 1 to let them know, and then we would you know continue on after that. Our goal is not to close down. I've already spent six. I've already spent seven thousand dollars on a facade sign. Sure. Um, uh, several thousand dollars on glass signage. The signage there that we're talking about along with the other signs are, are truly detrimental to business and you have to think about business and the economy and what's going on here. And I'm gonna reflect back to the previous case. I live a quarter mile from that intersection where, that, where the hemp sign is going up. And if you don't, if, they, if no one puts a sign there, that's just blight. That sign sitting there is blight. And I, I work at Danny Thomas and Firestone. My main office is on Tully Street. I've been there 23 years. And you want to talk about blight, I, I live through it every day. Um, I grew up, or not didn't grow up, but I lived for 20 years on White Station, at, at Poplar and White Station, where the new uh, strip center went in, mm -hmm. uh, just north of Poplar. And so that, that whole Yates, Poplar Avenue, that's, I mean, that's core. That's, that's core town. And, uh, people, before I had the facade sign up, we were open, you know, I still haven't got my UNO done because we're waiting on, on this piece of the puzzle. Uh, man, we couldn't find you, couldn't find you. I said, we're right there, I got, a, I got a truck parked out there. And people are starting to see the truck, but you don't, and now I got the facade sign up, and that's helping. But man, that, that sign, did you, it's, you're only 100 yards from Poplar Avenue. That sign is huge. And this is just a small, you know, we're a small business, but I went from Again, I was off 70% last year. It's, and we were the largest caterer in town. And this is, this is I'm, I'm talking economics here. And I understand the signage thing. I grew up in Germantown. My best friend's father was an architect, and he's the one that kept all the signs low and, 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 and in, in neutral colors. And I thought that was, you know, that was cool. I grew up with that. And I respect what you're trying to do as, an order, as, a, as a committee 
to make the signage better. But let me tell you, that blank sign up there, leaving it up there for another year or two, looks like blight to me versus a sign with a really cool popping logo and business driving and cars in and out of that parking lot. And I just ask you to move forward with this uh, because 365 days doesn't do anything but you know throw a couple thousand dollars out the window for me. Uh, it'll help, you know, put the sign up there, then what's going to happen? You know, if Loeb decides not to put a sign up there to put everybody's up there, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. The hemp people in the previous case are pretty smart. Their other people probably didn't want to spend the money to put a sign, you know, to co-mingle a sign or to put a joint sign up there. But they're willing to spend the money. Um, I just ask you to think from the economic side, and I appreciate y'all's y'all input. And okay. Thank you. Um, so here's what I would suggest, and y'all can tell me I'm crazy. Instead of one year, I'd go five years. So that gives him his, that's, I mean, that's what I would go for. That's, that's his lease. He's already spent money on it. He can't control his landlord, but he can in his next renewal do that. And at that point, whoever's going in, whoever Loeb needs to get in there is going to want to sign, and they're going to have to fix the whole thing. And it also gives them some time and some not great economic times to build up to, I don't know how much a sign is, but if he spent $7,000 on the outside, I would imagine it's $20,000 for a monument sign or, or, or even more. So that would be my, I would still keep the other amendments of if it's not used, it goes away. And then I would, I would suggest, and y'all can say you don't like it too. Uh, I would go five years on the sunset as opposed to one year. I agree with that. I, I would be inclined to vote for that as a condition because I think there's no other middle ground. I think that um, that puts them in a, a tricky position to have to strong arm the landlord um, if we if we give them a year. He, they have to strong arm the landlord without with or without the support of their um, the other tenants. So that's a tricky spot to be in. Mr. Jackson, do you have something to say? I saw you hit your microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think five years is a long time. I would say three. There, um, sorry, their option to renew is five years, right? Their leases five years. And the reason I said three was I think that would put pressure on the landlord to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying. I just feel bad for the the true applicant being or the 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 tenant who could just be left without a sign for two years but still under a lease if 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 Loeb doesn't step up. Um. So. I get, uh, any other thoughts on three versus five? And then maybe we do a short vote uh, just to determine Mr. What Chairman, I, I will support three if, if the other board members will support three. And uh, the thing about it is he, he's not necessarily left without a sign. I mean, a sign that conforms with the ordinance. I mean, they can uh, come in there and do something that uh, fits the ordinance, maybe put some landscaping in there in the process and suddenly that the whole character of that uh, center is improved. And um, I just think waiting five years, I just think that's But he can long. only do that with the landlord doing it for everybody. There's no, there's no other sign he has that he can do that's not a strip sign for all four tenants. He could come back in here at the end of three years and plead his case again. There sure. wouldn't be anything to stop him from doing that. Yeah. Um, He's, I agree with you, Chairman. He's not going to be doing that. He's the tenant. He doesn't own the signs. Uh, also, talking about putting landscaping in, I understand that's an ideal situation, but if you've ever been at this center and tried to park or do anything it parking is at a premium so I don't even know where you put the landscaping in um, uh, I, I agree with the five-year term um, I think it that gives low time to know that they are going to have to design and erect a pylon when one of these leases renews 
Um, and so they're prepared for that. All right, so it seems like we're between three and five. Um, I would... What well, does that mean, four? <laughs> <laughs> three and a half? I think we... Um, hmm. This is just deciding on what the condition is. So I'm just going to ask for us to do it. I'm just going to do a show of hands real quick. Who wants three? We got two for sure for three. JT, are you three or five? Five. Five. So it's five. two to four, and we'll just see. And so I think we're going to make the condition five, and then y'all can choose not to vote for it based on that. And and I respect that. Like, but if, if that makes sense. Um, is there any other discussion on this case? Mr. Whitehead, do you, do you need to add anything? I saw that you're talking to our friendly code enforcer. I don't know uh, if that was on this or just something else. Well, he was pointing out a situation, but I told him I have added, I have added flourishments to your conditions. Okay. <laughs> so we've already talked so, about so, condition two that speaks exactly to this condition, at this sign. We've talked about condition three that says if it goes vacant 365 days, it's lost its variance. And the new condition number four is, this variance shall terminate in five years, during which period the landlord is encouraged to eliminate as many of the other tenant signs as possible in an effort to uh, erect an integrated center sign. Okay. I well, think how, that it spells the, the intent of what the board is. Well, does this put the landlord on notice? Does he or she get the notice that they're on notice? Uh, I would think the tenant would give them the notice of this disposition. Well, the landlord's <laughs> here. <laughs> and they're here, yeah. Okay. But they, they, I mean, there's two scenarios. The landlord could say, okay, this tenant lost his sign. Or the landlord could say, you know, it's, it's, gonna, be an, it's gonna be an intense five-way negotiation and we're giving them five years. So, you know, we'll know in five years whether it was a successful negotiation or not. And if not, it's this, this bay that would have to come back for, to re-up its sign. Okay, so now I'm thinking, um, okay. not to change anything, but again, I think with even the people that voted five, they would rather have three than not have, than have the case fail. Should we bifurcate and just see if we get the votes on the five year, like officially being in condition? How would we, I just want to know procedurally how we can do that. I don't want the whole thing to fail over five years if it would succeed on three. Let's try this. Any member who votes in the on the prevailing side can immediately request for reconsideration. And if this fails or fails to get five votes, then someone who voted yes or who voted who no, voted no can, okay. because no would be, correct. be the no prevailing would be the, side okay. could then ask for reconsideration and then go down to three. Okay, is that clear with it? Okay. But any other discussion before we vote? All right, hearing none, Mr. Whitehead, will you give us a roll call vote? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Doss? Yes. Mr. Claybrook? Yes. Ms. Baker? Yes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Malazari? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. And Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. Six eyes. All right, thank you all for coming down. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, would you call the next case? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number five is docket BOA 2157, located at 528 Baltimore. The applicant is Jacobs Ladder Community Development Corporation, and the representative is Bill Marlar. The use district is the multifamily RU district, and the request is a use range from 252 to allow multifamily senior housing. Is the applicant present? I see you, and I know we had some opposition, right, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, okay. If y'all wanna just, you don't have, if you wanna come down kinda of to the front row just to be ready, uh, the applicant opposition, and Mr. Bacchus, if you could give us a staff report, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you and other members of the board and, who are, and all who are present. This is the um, item number five uh, at 528 Baltimore Street, uh, the south, uh, 
southwest corner of Baltimore and Felix Avenue in the Beltline community. As stated, the use variance, this is a use variance to section 252, subsection 252 of the zoning code to allow multifamily residential housing in the RU1 district, which is primarily a single family and duplex district. Uh, this land use is in the proposed land use is in the Beltline community just east of the fairgrounds uh, area and also uh, at the southwest corner of Felix and Baltimore Street is currently zone RU1. As a zoning district and the zoning boundaries, the predominant zoning in the area is RU1. The predominant land use east of Bunton Street is primarily single family, uh, while to the west of Bunton Street you have duplexes and uh, a large swath of vacant lots, almost entire blocks, as well as some places of worship, institutional uses for daycare, and also duplex residential and single family sporadically uh, thrown throughout the, uh, the street blocks. This is the site plan uh, that the applicant has proposed. Here you have uh, four single family or possibly four single family uh, senior housing units uh, located on, on the immediate corner with an access drive, private drive to the rear of the property. The owner of this property currently owns the adjacent property. The adjacent property will be, will be included in this application, well, included in the site plan to allow for parking on the adjacent lot. Single ownership, you can cross lot lines. The, however, the applicant is needed another variance for parking. Uh, the required parking is one space per unit for studio uh, housing. These are front and rear elevations. Uh, I believe this would be on Felix Avenue. And these are, this is the inner uh, grounds of the property, uh, the common open space to the rear of the units. The, this front elevation uh, will face Felix Avenue and the, these elevations are interior to the lot. In conclusion, uh, the applicant has submitted a site plan to allow the use variance for multiple buildings on a lot for three or four uh, units of senior living housing uh, with required parking to the rear uh, and on an adjacent partial and single ownership. Uh, the public records reveal the lot is, is a consolidated lot of record, being lots from 31 and 32 of the Beltline subdivision. Uh, it has 50 feet of lot frontage and 80 feet in depth, including an adjacent lot to the south. Uh, home designs, uh, they, do, they do not meet the RU1 district standards by the use variance uh, to allow multiple buildings uh, with rear parking and common open space is supported with setbacks meeting the contextual inferior standards in the zoning code. The practical difficulty uh, does, does exist in, in exceptional narrowness and exceptional shallowness of a partial with a corner lot status for single family and in the district and to provide required parking. Uh, however, a variance for one parking space, as mentioned earlier, is also required uh, for the four units if the applicants choose to do that. The Memphis 3.0, um, and based on the form and location characteristics of uh, an existing land use of this area, this proposed proposal is consistent with the goals of the Memphis 3.0 comprehensive plan. The findings of fact as listed in the zoning code have been met, and the lot does, does exhibit uh, an exceptional narrowness and shallowness for a permitted use in the district. Uh, the Division of Planning and Development is recommending approval with conditions. Those conditions can be found on page 11 of the staff report. Uh, the site plan conditions are before you on the screen, and primarily to allow for the multifamily residential housing units and uh, one reduction, reduction in the required parking spaces to three if the applicant chooses to uh, uh, construct four senior housing units. And of course, the final plan will be subject to review and approval by staff and, and if the applicant appeals that final plan, site plan, he, can, he will be required to come before you to, um, for uh, an adjustment or modification to the site plan. Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Uh, we, we did receive calls uh, concerning the notice, uh, several, maybe a couple calls. We also received a couple calls regarding the use and an adjacent property owner concerned about the location and orientation of the buildings. Uh, but the primarily um, the notice requirement 
The notice uh, stated Thursday, June 23rd. The only uh, notice, the only difference in that notice was the day instead of the date. So the date was correct, the day was incorrect. With that, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have of us. Uh, and we will uh, proceed with the uh, use variance request. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions of the board of Mr. Baucus? All right, hearing none, uh, would the applicant please come forward? If you'll come, come and you'll give your name and address for the record for us. Yes, sir, when you're talking, please, you can. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Reverend Bill Marler. I'm the director for Jacob's Ladder Community Development Corporation. Can you give your address? 158 Marne Street, Memphis, Tennessee, 38111. Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so hope you got? Yes, I do. All right, go ahead, sir. And you have 10 minutes to speak, if you need it. Well, Jacob's Ladder is a servant organization to the community. We began in 2005, and I'll make this quick, but we, um, when we first came to the Beltline, um, it was struggling with many, many issues, and um, overwhelming blight was one of them. And as we began to clear some of that blight, we noticed that crime began to drop, so we are interested in that. Uh, another thing that really impressed us was the uh, condition of seniors having to live in uh, dilapidated shotgun houses. Their uh, utility bills were off the map, and frequently they were not connected with their neighbors. And we personally, I'm a personal witness to people uh, having died in the Beltline, and they would languish, their body would languish in their home for a week or two weeks before they were discovered. So that's part of my personal experience. So we decided that one way to serve the community would be to address an affordable housing uh, project for seniors. And I asked my friend and architect, uh, Jimmy Tucker, to come down and look at this site and look it over carefully. Can we make something that's attractive here and compatible with the neighborhood? Uh, can we also do this using the latest uh, and best technology so that we can provide uh, uh, a nice structure with a very small utility bill? Um, we've come up with some very innovative ways to do that. Um, so, you know, basically that's where we are. Um, I could, I'm a preacher, I could talk forever, <laughs> but you need to put a sock in my mouth or grab a hook or something, but uh, we're excited about this. We uh, know most of the neighborhood. Uh, we get along with most folks, not everybody, but we get along with most, and uh, so... There you have it. I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, Reverend Robert Williams was on our board for years. He pastored a church right across the street called Williams Temple. Uh, Robert was on our board for 10 years or so, but he told me that uh, there's nothing that had been built in this neighborhood or done in this community for so long that anybody that did anything new, there was going to be a little bit of pushback. So that's Reverend Robert Williams. He passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he was a good personal friend of mine. And so anyway. I, I have a few questions for you. Yes, sir. Um, how many square, roughly how many square feet is each unit? Uh, about 435 square feet. Is, it, is there a separate bedroom or is it just all kind of one studio type build? Uh, it's, there's a common area for bedroom, living room, and that's the, the common area. And then we have separate kitchen and bath and utility room. Okay. And then beyond that, in the back, we have a common area that's uh, uh, for people to gather 
and to uh, become friends and neighbors. Um, and, and, you know, this is just a personal thing, but I have found uh, as a revitalization person that seniors love their neighborhood and they have a story to tell and that needs to be protected. And in our particular situation, we have, uh, we need to protect our seniors. They, uh, and I think that this would be a great place to do that. It, it affords us some commonality an opportunity to uh, make new friends. Um, I have another minister on my board that worked for Wesley Senior Ministries and he told me that the number one objection to uh, seniors relocating out of their neighborhood and having to go into like Wesley Senior uh, Tower uh, Ministry, a, a high rise, was that they were already giving up uh, so much. They were giving up their neighborhood and they were giving up their space, their individuality. Uh, so something like this is an answer, I think, to that. People that live in the Beltline uh, can, and there are many there that want to stay there, but their situation is difficult. And so this gives them an opportunity to live in the neighborhood that they love. Uh, this gives them an opportunity to have a utility bill that's $50 a month or less, uh, except for the garbage cart, okay? That's going to almost double it. Uh, it's going to uh, be quiet. These houses are built with the latest technology, which means concrete walls that look like uh, a, a regular house. I mean, you can see it right there, but they're quiet. Um, you know, it's, everything about it, I think, is, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, up and up. Okay, are there any other questions for the applicant? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what, what would the rent levels be on these units? I assume they're rental. Uh, we were hoping uh, for $450 a month, uh, which I think would be very good. We're seeing a lot of housing over there where people pay more than that for a shotgun house. Um, and so we wanted to get the uh, rental level down low, and then if the utility bill was, uh, you know, fifty, seventy-five dollars, something in that range, then somebody that had, um, you know, eight hundred dollars to live on a month, uh, they could make it there. Okay. Other questions of the applicant this time? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Uh, used about five minutes, so you'll have five minutes in additional rebuttal to the two minutes if you need it. Okay. Um, is there and is there anybody else here to speak in uh, support of this application? All right, seeing none, then we'll move to the uh, opposition. So, uh, ma'am, you'd like to come up, one of you, or and if you'll give your name and address for the record for me. My name is Lois Lambert Ryan. I prefer not to give my working at. I prefer to give my working address. That's a, that's a, 201 work. Poplar, LL56. I'm owner of the property at 536 Baltimore, which is adjacent to this development. Okay, let me uh, swear you in real quick. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of you got? I do. All right, go ahead, ma'am. I am the owner of the property at 536 Baltimore, next door to this development. Jacob's Ladder owns over 70 lots in this subdivision. I, I don't know whether they purchased them. I, I don't know. I know they cut the grass. I know Mr. Marler uh, inspects the area and is a frequent walker of the area and looking in the windows of the houses that are vacant. I inherited this piece of property from my mother and stepfather who were secondary owners, uh, generational owners of the property. Uh, there has been growth and development in that area, at least at 536 Baltimore. The Hearth Program renovated my mother's and stepfather's house through Memphis, Memphis Community Development. We were told at that time that 38111 was going to be a new development under that Hearth Program dealing with the properties in the area. It was even on television that 38111 in the fairgrounds area and district was going to be redeveloped. I will speak directly toward the proposed development. It is too small. The variances are required and asked because it is too small of a piece of property. 
Jacob's Ladder owns 70 lots in this uh, Beltline subdivision, 70 lots. The lots on my block, Baltimore, surround my property, other than one lot that's on the street behind me. That means that the property next door to me, which is on the, makes a fifth house on that small area. There is gonna be virtually an impossibility for the seniors to sit out and coalesce as indicated. Because the cars are gonna be too big. There's no way for them to drive in and to turn around and to drive out and to coalesce. There's no green space will be available. Jacob's Ladder owns over 70 lots in the Beltline apartment, Beltline community. I don't know why they chose this corner small lot that a church was on. In front of that properties are uh, an apartment complex which has been renovated four or five times since my parents have lived over there. Those are studio apartments. Next to the studio apartments on the other side and across in front of me is a, a rooming house. Behind me, there's a rooming house. These properties look pretty decent for rooming houses. I have a rental property. The lots be, uh, behind, on the side of me and behind me, and you can look across three blocks, and they're all vacant. I do not know why Jacob's Ladder is choosing to put these homes on such a small strip when there's plenty of property for development. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the proposed plan of development by the CDC. If they're gonna cram these little brick block houses on this little, uh, little, little corner, what is the plan for the rest of the properties they own? If this is the first start of their development? Uh, the concept is uh, incredible. It's not feasible, and I ask that you not grant the variance. And there was no hearing and discussions amongst the citizens that do own properties there in the area. And the notice was given, it was sent out, had the wrong date. Thank you. I ask you not allow the variance and permit the development. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Ms. Uh, Lambert Ryan? I have one question. What if it was a smaller number of units? Would that make a difference? Like three units or two no. units? No. Okay. I'll tell you why. Okay. There's already a shotgun house there uh, that was modeled. Uh, the property was a small church, the mm -hmm. CME church, and then the church owned the shotgun house. There is a person that's living in a shotgun house now. There's really just a small driveway that separates uh, where this little small church was. And so there's not a space or a swing that you can make in this area for a parking. Uh, the parking they're talking about would be behind the shotgun house, at least one spot. But the other problem that I have is his other properties that he owns are right on the other side of my house. And there's no easement. So if he builds these little small houses, there's no uh, enough room for parking. There's no enough room for gathering. If it is as he has envisioned it, a, a development, a community development project, let that be the green space. Uh, the frontage of these houses are right there on the sidewalk. Uh, Felix in Baltimore, um, it's a very cultured and interesting socioeconomic area. If I can say it that way. I track that. Uh, I'm for the development, but he owns 70 lots, 70 vacant lots in a three or four block radius. Why this particular little corner? Uh, it's a busy corner because we have an L-shaped apartment complex right there. We have a rooming house right next to the L-shaped apartment complex. We have a rooming house one block over. And also, he owns the lot that goes from Baltimore to uh, the next street, I think it's uh, Bunton. Bunton. He owns that whole little strip. So if he really wanted to put parking, he could put parking on that strip. So the, the concept, uh, the frontage is not going to work for seniors. Tell me again, the parking, He's, you said the parking could be put on where? Right next to the apartments. Those houses he's talking about building. He owns a total strip. 
uh, uh, from Felix to, is it Bonta? From Felix to Bonta, and this is looking on the in the application and looking at the plotting in the application. That so he owns. Oh, the apartments Ms. across Ms. the street? Lambert no, Ryan. no, no. Going so looking at, the, looking at the map up there, mm -hmm. you see yeah, the subject sorry, property. I, my vision is not you, that good. Okay. You're saying he owns the property immediately right of the thing. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Just want to make sure I understood. At me east. Yes, ma'am. And this is a narrow strip. It's about as narrow a strip as, uh, according to the map, the plot map that he, he uh, that was tendered with the application, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of vacant uh, pieces of property. So that could be the parking. And the people are going to have to turn around the back of the house next to mine, shining lights into my tenant's house. My residence. I got a good tenant. I got a good tenant. Uh, I just think there are other options available to uh, Jacobs Ladder Community Development Corporation. There's multiple properties. As I indicated, they own 70 lots. 70 lots, many of which are two times larger than this one. Uh, but as far as the properties in concern, uh, actual houses and for seniors, it's just not a good corner for seniors. But there are other parts of that. And I welcome the development. I welcome the development. It needs to be something revitalized. But when they said they were going to do 38111 and it was all on TV, what they said they were going to, the city was going to try to make some type of development to entice younger city employees, such as police officers and other city employees, to move into that area by building new homes. That was going to be the enticement. And we were jumping up and down in my mom's living room. And that was been several years ago. And this is not what that is. And I don't know about anybody dying in their house and not being found. But my folks lived there a long time. And yes, my stepfather died in the house. He was found by the neighbors. And he didn't languish. Any other questions from Ms. Lambert Ryan? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, ma'am, if you'll give your name and address for the record for us. Linda Harris. And you can pull that down. It'll move, so you don't have to stretch your neck. Okay. Uh, Linda Harris. Yes, ma'am. 563 Bunton, 38111. Okay. Um, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the true stuff you got? I do. All right, go ahead, Miss Harris. Yes, like she said, he owns quite a bit of uh, vacant lots there. My house is next to one of the vacant lots that he has. He comes up there and cut the grass. And yes, Jacob Ladders has built other homes in that area. But also, he's had community centers that are not open anymore. They're closed. One was for children, one was for teenagers. So when we talk about blight, that's part of the blight, too, because those are empty apart, empty houses, too. He also has a house on um, Midland, and I can't remember the other street. That's empty as far as I know. There's one house that's vacant, uh, that's occupied, straight down button, that's a Jacob Ladder's house. Now this kindly soft-spoken creature who has a vacant lot next to me has a tree on that property. I asked him, could he remove the limbs off of my property? He told me to get it myself. So I don't know about the community, all the mine that he has, I don't know about that because he, he didn't come to me like that. So I object to it. Uh, there are other places he could put this property, and like she said, it's gonna be so tiny. Nobody's gonna be able to live in there, not, not no grown up senior. So I object. Thank okay. you. Are there any questions for Ms. Harris? All right. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anybody else here in opposition to this case? Hearing none, if the applicant would like to come uh, back, we have seven minutes if you need that to uh, rebut anything. Go ahead, sir. Am I on again? You're, you're still sworn in, so. <laughs> okay. Um, one major correction here. Um, we are a servant group to the community. Um, for the record, 
Jacob's Ladder owns 18 properties in the entire Beltline. Now, if you go back and look at the Register of Deeds, uh, we have a non, we have a for-profit company that sort of works a little bit with us, and they're called Ladder Partners, and they own, they do own a lot of those lots, okay? But the one on the corner there, that red one that we um, made the petition for and we're here about, um, we own a shotgun house uh, directly next to it, and then after that, that's it. We don't own anything else. So we feel like this is a very, very good place to do that kind of work. Um, we have another, um, a little bit larger lot, um, one street over on Boston, a corner lot that we bought from Williams Temple. And if we're successful with this one, we would like to try to uh, learn from our mistakes or whatever, and then maybe build another one. Uh, the Beltline has 2,800 people in it. Its uh, elderly population is roughly 20%. So the math there is uh, maybe 500 or so, and we have a growing elderly population with no uh, real way to uh, transition uh, into something comfortable. So that was the idea behind that particular spot there. Again, we own 18. We're not some massive uh, group or anything like that. And, this whole thing came about because of our personal observations. Um, I can say that um, 536, the lady that did speak, uh, I knew a Mr. Brown. I don't know if Mr. Brown was was a relative of yours or not, but okay. Mr. Brown did pass away at that house, and uh, I don't know how long he was there before he was found. We can't. Um, yeah. But he would be a an example, I could cite several. So we're trying to build community. Um, our architect has come up with something that he really thinks is good and it meets our design criteria and our philosophy. And our basic philosophy is, is that healthy communities take care of their elderly. And so this is an attempt to do that. And I thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm looking at, at this map and um, that property that you own to the east is vacant and larger, not a whole lot larger, but a little bit. So, so I do, you know, what, what was your reason for choosing the smaller properties to put, I think you have four units in this development. Is that correct? That, that's that's my question. Why did you? Why wouldn't you put it on the larger property? Because the density is high. I'm not, trying to find my place on that map up there, ma'am. Not that there's anything wrong with high density, okay. but well, we don't have that property. It says you do uh, that property just to the Red east. Partners, I believe, owns it. That's different than Jacob's Ladder. What is different? Uh, that's a different. That's a different group. We do not own that. Oh, okay. So if we, okay. if we, um, and, and we struggle with the parking scheme here because we were compressed. We didn't own that. If we, if we did, um, then we would probably try to expand a little bit. Um, so that's the issue there. And I did talk to the to the owner of that, and right now he's a little bit reticent to to to, to sell it uh, to us. Uh, but he is in favor of what we're trying to do, and that's Ladder Partners. That's a guy named Lon Magnus, uh, who is the owner. Okay, well you answered my question. You do not own that larger property that's, that's just to the east of this. That's actually two properties. Yes, it is. Okay. All right. You did own one of them a few years ago, right? The one along 
Felix. Looks like it was quick claim from Jacob's Ladder to Ladder Partners in 2018. That, really, that, that probably happened. And it's, and it's thin. That, it was, that probably happened. Yeah. But the other one, it doesn't look like there it. There were two it properties that was together sale. with uh, burnout houses. Sure. And we acquired them and bulldozed them. I mean, they were they were way too far gone to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Sir, could you tell us the relationship between Jacob's Ladder and Ladder Partnerships? What is the relationship between you all? There's no legal relationship. Um, we have a, a working philosophy to try to remove the blight. There's been an enormous issue with that. So they have, they have uh, enough money to deal with that. Um, but we have no you know, official relationship. Um, I do believe that the owner of Ladder Partners would like to build uh, single family houses on these uh, lots that are vacant. So I think that that's the, um, the goal. Uh, we started out together about five or six years ago with the idea of um, repurposing the land so getting rid of the blight, there was about 60 houses that were way too far gone uh, that needed to be removed, and we've been working on those since about 2005. Um, I think at this point, um, uh, rebuilding with uh, the idea of, of um, let's say, a moderate income families living in new single family housing is probably going to happen over there, okay? So Ladder Partners is a much bigger economic engine than we've got. We're a bunch of church folks and do-gooders and a bunch of Methodist preacher, liberal do-gooders trying to carve out a spot here and make it better. So the um, um, you know, that's where we are. Our economic engine's a little bit smaller, okay? Yes, sir. You answered my question about there was no, you said there was no legal relationship. Is there any spinoff from one to the other? Has there been any? No. Uh, the, um, the owner of Ladder Partners uh, has asked me to cut grass, okay? So I cut about 100, and, it's actually about 120 lots instead of 70, okay? And, you know, when you cut that much grass, you get to know your neighbors. I wear about three hats. I'm uh, either a pastor to some or a friend to some or somebody's asking me how to do this or do that, but you get to know everybody and you also get to know all of the uh, code violations and the people that uh, are living on the other side of the law with, you know, drugs and that kind of thing. So, you know, I get a first-hand look at, at, uh, at wearing that hat, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? <coughs> Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, with that, unless there's other questions, we get a motion to approve BOA 2021-57 as conditioned by staff. So moved. Second. You move and say, is there any discussion? I'm just trying to wrap my head around th this. I, I, um, I like it in theory. Um, I like it in theory. I take the point about the corner not being ideal and the avail uh, wonder the availability or or in the availability of other properties that they own in the area and the parking. So I, you know, the, this board in particular um, tends to lean towards solutions. And I'm not sure what the solution is with the parking situation. I mean, it is a tight cluster and I, think maybe if you could get the parking situation together, you can spare the green space, or maybe if you take a warehouse, 
you can still have the green space? I'm not sure. Is, uh, Mr. Bacchus, the parking is shown on there. Does that meet guidelines for the turnarounds to be able to go in? I mean, it'd be a front end and I guess the turnaround to get out. But is that, I can't read the amounts of how wide that drive is or anything. Yeah, it appears that the drive would be a minimum of 12 feet wide. That, that's a requirement for private drives. Okay. Uh, the parking, it appears that this is enough maneuvering room to exit the site in a forward motion. Uh, if that's a 90 degree parking space, it's approximately 18 feet in length, at least 18 and a half feet in length. Um, it may not be drawn to scale on this site plan. This is a, uh, a, um, a rendering for, for lack of a better site plan, but these will be uh, finalized in their final site plan uh, prior to uh, notice of disposition. The turnaround, does the turnaround compromise the other neighbors? You said they'll be able to go out on a forward exit in a forward motion. Yes. But they don't have to do a turnaround that will disturb the other neighbors? No, that, that, that when they back out, when a person comes into this property, they'll park and then of course they, when they get ready to back out, they can back out, um, you know, there's enough maneuvering room to, to back in. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, to, to drive in and then drive out in a forward motion. In other words, I, I may not be... Here, I'm following just you. Just follow me on the screen yeah. here. Uh, the cursor, yeah. as you take a left turn here off of Felix, you come into the drive, you yeah. go to the last parking space, you turn, mm -hmm. turn in at the 90 degree angle, and you back out, mm -hmm. and you go back out forward. Okay. They can do that with this okay. amount of space. I mean, I was thinking about how the houses are situated in Uptown. They they have a little narrow drive yeah. between the houses. I mean, I kind of hit the this neighbors. This is a, a little, little bit different situation. <laughs> uh, they're mostly, their parking is primarily to the rear as well, but it's in a different, it's a different scenario. Uh, corner lot's a little bit difficult, but this the, the fact that he owns the adjacent property it kind of gives him the opportunity to allow parking for everybody and of course you could have allowances for a decrease in parking for parking along the street and within so many feet of bus lines and things of that nature can they park safely on the street though with that being the corner lot is that is on street parking I would, I would, I think on street parking is allowed on most all residential streets, except for corners. I mean, you can, there are people who park in the corners, you know, but that's, you really can't, not supposed to do that, but mm -hmm. uh, you can, you can safely park on a 50 foot wide street with sidewalks. And what you mean by, you don't want to park in the curve of a corner, but you can park up to, like, as long as you're on the straight part of the street, yeah, if you're not, not in the... Yeah. the yeah, you can park up to the radius. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Thank you. I, thank you for using radius. That's the yeah. word I couldn't get out, so... And Any these other are, questions? I'm not sure if they're, you know, seeing... I don't know what kind of seniors. Are these seniors that drive? Are they... I mean, I mean, that's a little in the weeds. Are these seniors that drive? Are these seniors that are active? Are they in and out all day? I have, like, a million questions in that vein. Yeah, like, how you... Answer. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts mm -hmm. or questions? And, and and keep in mind, this this graphic may be stretched a little, <laughs> yeah. so it may not be accurately depicted on the screen. Uh, I can see a stretch in, in, in the north-south direction. Okay, gotcha. And Mr. Jackson. Yes, Mr. Marcus, if yes, you sir. could speak to the density and how you, how you as a planner feel about that. The density in this area for this type of studio housing, senior housing, is not as great as a duplex. Well, it's greater than a duplex, but it's not as intrusive as a duplex or any other multifamily housing in this area. Uh, as, as you heard in testimony, there are apartments in, across the street. So <clears throat> this density is not uh, out of the unusual in this, on, along or on this side of these particular blocks. 
from that perspective, we felt the use variance is a, an alternative to uh, a different housing type to allow for seniors to stay within, to, to, to um, stay in place. So from a broad perspective, we're looking at it from a, uh, from a, a place making, uh, this is, we're going outside of variance stuff and I'm speaking my planner cap, but we go out, you know, we're looking at place making where a individual can, can stay in their community. And this is what Mr. Reverend Mall is trying to accomplish here to allow for an alternative to senior housing, but at the same time keeping him, keeping that person or that senior within their neighborhood, adjacent to their neighbors, and within uh, close proximity to family. So from that perspective, the density outweighs, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the placemaking outweighs the density in that regard. Thank you, sir. And each unit is 450 square feet. That's my understanding. I was doing some rough, mm -hmm. very shoddy math in my mind. So I see that the total area is 5,200 square feet. That's the total lot area, correct? The total area, okay. So that's roughly 19, wait, 1,900 feet, 1,800 feet? 1,800 square feet. Per, per unit. For the, for the unit, all four units take up about 1,800 square feet, not including the green space. Uh, yes, it's plus or minus 1,800, yes. Total floor area you were talking about. Floor, you're talking about floor area, correct? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. 450 times four. Right, correct. Yes. <clears throat> Always check my math. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? That I seem to be ready to vote. Mr. Whitehead, will you give us a roll call, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Claybrook? Yes. Ms. Doss? Yes. Ms. Baker? Yes. Mr. Malazri? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes, I find the standards for 9.22.6 are being met in this case. That's six eyes. Uh, been approved. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming down, the applicant and the opposition. And good luck with your project. Mr. Uh, Whitehead, will you call our next case, please? Agenda item number eight is docket VOA 2021 located at 1360 Springbrook. The applicant is Bantam Apartment Holdings, LLC, represented by Cindy Reeves. The use district is the EMP Employment District, and the request is a variance from item 4915 F1C to allow the reuse of a sign that's been abandoned for more than 365 days. Okay, uh, see the applicant's present. Is there any opposition to case number eight? Seeing none. Mr. Skinner, give us like a, just a quick overview, and then we'll move on to uh, issues. I think we've heard a lot about signs today, but sure. tell us how this is different than what we heard before. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, Lucas Skinner with Office of Planning and Development. Um, I have a really brief presentation, but I'll keep it even briefer. Um, so the location is at 1360 Springbrook. Um, again, for similar variances, um, again, for abandonment, as well as for landscaping requirements, uh, this is a zoning map to just show where the location of the property is. Uh, it's very close to the Brooks Road and I-55 interchange. A few site photos. Um, the photo on the top left has the site or the sign in question. Uh, the photo to the right has just sort of the, the back of the location. Uh, and this is the sign. Um, it's 65 feet in height uh, with approximately 222 square feet of signage. Uh, staff is recommending approval with conditions. Um, I think Memphis 2.0 was not applicable. Um, I'm around for any questions. Mr. Chairman? I'm looking at the sign, sorry. Uh, just thinking, okay. Is there, are there any questions of staff before we move forward? Hearing none, Ms. Reeves, will you give your name and address for the record for us? Cindy Reeves, SR Consulting, 5909 Shelby Oaks Drive, Suite 200. All right, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got? I do. All right, go ahead. Why don't you uh, add to this for us? 
Um, this is Bantam Apartments. They made a huge improvement in this area. The property zoned employment. It used to be a motel, and they have put in $4 million in converting this into apartments. The visibility that they would have from I-55 and the on-ramp to I-55 is part of the reason they want to continue to reuse and repurpose the existing sign on site. Um, the sign will give them the visibility that they need, and it will let people know that they are there, that that is where that they can come to be at home. So we would appreciate y'all taking into consideration and approving us to be able to repurpose and reuse the existing sign. Okay, and tell me a little bit more about the, the use. It's not a motel anymore, it's apartments. Correct. But are they, why would people need to find their, a bit huge sign to find their apartment? So um, tell me what's different. Okay. It sounds it's like very, they need to, and I don't understand. It's very, very different. Okay. Is, and y'all heard this case in 2008, I think it okay. was. Uh, 2008 or 18, I can't remember. But it's called One Stop Housing, and they're out of Florida. And what they do is they do a monthly lease. It's affordable housing. And then they go in every month, and they inspect the housing. They have rules and regulations, and it's people that are trying to get back on their feet. And this gives them an opportunity to get back on their feet without having to live in their car on the streets or in the extended stay kind of hotels. And they, it's a monthly thing. It's a monthly lease. So they have very, very strict rules. And whenever we came before the board in 2018, I think it was, the, the board thought that this was a good thing for the neighborhood. And it has made a big improvement in the neighborhood since they have opened. So they would just like to continue to use the existing sign. So it's month to month. Okay. Are there any other questions of the uh, applicant? All right, thank you very much. Again, is there any opposition to this case? Seeing none, um, would somebody give us a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, go, yes, sir, go ahead. Yeah, I, I pulled this off. Um, and it, you pretty much hit on, on, on the reason. Um, now that it's not, I mean, you can see why a motel would need right. a sign that tall and that large. Uh, but you know, multifamily, we don't put signs that big on multifamily and certainly not that tall. And uh, it just doesn't seem to be needed any longer. And um, so it just seems like a good time to, I, I mean, I'm thinking what, when this was converted to apartments, it might've been a good time to also change the sign. Uh, to something that would go with apartments. So that's it. That's why I pulled it off. Sure. It just doesn't um, seem necessary anymore. Well, uh, Ms. Rees, if you could come back for a second. I got a question. Uh, so it's kind of a hybrid kind of thing going on with these monthly leases. Like, what's the average time someone lives there? I mean, are people living there for years? They really just live in there for a month or two. There's a lot of them that only live there for a month or two until they can get on their feet or, you know, go live with a relative or whatever. But there's some that you know, that end up being office managers there and they, they you know, end up taking care of the place. So it, it varies between a month to a year. I mean, it just, it just depends on the person's situation, but they just feel that with it being month to month, they do have a little bit more of a turnover than a regular apartment because normally apartment would be a year lease. And these, once you get on your feet, then you have the opportunity to get out of your lease. You're not in a year lease. So with it being month to month, it's on the interstate, and it just they felt that the visibility was extremely important for them. And that's one of the reasons that they chose that site, because of the employment area surrounding it. How many units is it? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I did bring the old, old case, so let sure. me see. <laughs> I I mean, it's definitely different than just your standard apartment complex. It absolutely But everybody that goes at least knows where it is once they hit it once. <laughs> and then they're there for at least 30 days of being able to find where they live. I'm looking at the... I didn't have a specific number of Sorry, I'm just reading. I'm not sure how many units it is. Um, it's a pretty large complex. Yeah. All right, 
are there any other questions? Um, if you'll see, if you'll show the aerial, you'll see how large it is. Yeah, it goes back pretty far. Yes, doesn't it, it does. And they've made a huge improvement. What What is the building to the east? Is that that is um, brother? Okay. Not brother. Excuse me. Smith yeah. and nephew. Smith, Smith and nephew. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they have welcomed them in the neighborhood. That it was a huge improvement for for them to to know that it was not going to be a motel anymore because there is another motel across the street that they would wish would maybe convert. Yeah, much more transient. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other questions of the applicant or comments before we go to discussion? Hearing none, could we get a motion to approve BOA? 20 or 2021-61 as conditioned by staff. So moved. Second. I'd be moved and second. Is there further discussion? Mr. Jackson. Um, Mr. Chairman, I agree with Ms. Baker. I don't just don't see the need for a 65 foot tall sign for multifamily. I mean, if it was still a hotel property adjacent to the interstate, I agree, but 65 feet for multifamily? No, I just doesn't make sense to me. I agree with Mr. Jackson. I, um, we had a case. It was a different neighborhood. It was on Germantown Road, the view, those apartments. The issue was a little bit about the height, but and then but the lighting. Um, but that sign, just in comparison, probably was half the size of this. And like architecturally nice. It was like nice. It was a nice, it was nice. They, they yeah. made it look good. And then it on the typically lights. most apartment buildings might have a monument sign of some sort with some landscaping or whatever they have a little duck pond or whatever. So, I mean, I don't think it's necessary either, but I mean, maybe half the size of that, whatever is allowable, but maybe half the size of it, maybe yeah, I'm better at constructed. The Google Earth view, you can see it from the interstate. I mean, you see the yeah. building, the front the canopy and everything. I don't know if it was reduced some. I, I don't know what the ordinance allows it to be, but right, still pretty visible. It's a, it's a big honking sign. Well, you're talking about the building itself. Well, I'm saying this, yeah, it's the, the sign. sign actually, yeah. the, the building itself you can see from the interstate. Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> so if the sign was a little bit smaller. Or just whatever code allows. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Once you're getting rid of that sign, it doesn't matter. You just probably build it to go. Ask the um, Wikipedia. Yeah. Josh, what is allowed there? Yeah, I think I, I, I agree. You know, with it even with it being more people coming in and, and multiple tenants per year, it just seems like man, that's a big sign. It's not like somebody trying to find a business they may not go to for another year or something like that. Like they just got to find it once. And most people have a phone that's going to take them there, you know, and so once, you know, just be careful the first time. So, um, any other comments before we vote? Well, do we need to make a condition about the height of the sign or the style of the sign? I think that we just would, Down it sounds like it's just going to be voted. No, they can't use that sign and they can build whatever sign that's allowed. That makes sense. I'm fine with that. If that's the way the vote goes, I'm just reading the room. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Whitehead, would you give us a roll call, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Claybrook? No. Uh, Ms. Doss? No. Mr. Jackson? No. Ms. Baker? No. No. Mr. Chairman? Uh, no, I find that. Uh, Conditions of 9.22.6 are not being met. That's six no's. All right, it was not approved. Mr. White, would you call the next case for us? <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item number nine is docket BOA 2021 62, located at 3375 Summer. The applicant is Mathana Inc., represented by Dedrick Brittenham Jr. The use district is the MU Mixed Use District, and the request is a section 922 1 appeal of an administrative decision. Rejecting a proposed site plan with convenience store, excuse me, site plan of a convenience store with gas pumps. Okay, I see the applicant is present. Was there any opposition for this? Is just a, or is there opposition? Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Davis, will you give us an overview of where we're at on this uh, decision that was made? Uh, do you have a point Mr. of order that we... Yes, Devin okay. Brittenham, I represent the applicant. My address is 3385 Airways Boulevard, Suite 229. All right, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing the truth? So, God? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead. All right, uh, before we hear the staff report, uh, I'd like to pass out a, a copy of the application. Um, and, and the reason I want to pass out a copy of the application is because the application contained in the staff report does not represent what was submitted to the to the okay. Board of Mr. Pendis, do you mind just pass that out so we can have it while we're looking at it? All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Davis, if you'll proceed on. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, members of the board and public. It's such a pleasure to be here in person with y'all again. And we even have this plexiglass keeping us safe. Right. This is case BOA 21-62. It's an appeal uh, of an administrative decision. So unlike the other cases you've considered today, you'll not be looking at the six variance criteria, but you'll be looking instead at whether the Unified Development Code itself was administered uh, correctly. All right. So some general information on this case. It's located at 3375 Summer Avenue. The owner and appellant is Motana, Inc., represented by Mr. Brittenham. Um, fun fact, I believe, graces uh, the walls of our chambers today. The request is an appeal of a DPD decision to reject a proposed site plan of a convenience store with gas pumps. The area of the site is 0 0.6 acres. It is zoned mixed use MU, although that is in contention. Uh, and that's what we're discussing today. And the, uh, it has two frontages on summer and on broad, where summer and broad meet the eastern terminus of broad. And this is where we're looking. It's in Highland Heights. Here's an aerial photograph. Um, you see that the building is along that curved frontage of broad. The building seen here was demolished in 2019. Land use map uh, reflects the commercial nature of Summer Avenue, although there are two adjacent civic uses, a church to the west and a fire station to the south. This is not very visible on your screen. Um, I believe it's on page seven in your staff reports, um, and I was going to just walk through this timeline with you um, if you want to follow along in the text. Um, so this, this is sort of a timeline of, of events of review of the applied for building permit and subsequent applied for site plan review, um, along with some of the city council's considerations of the rezoning of Summer Avenue. So what's not included in this table is 2013, the appellant purchased the site from Shelby County tax sale in 2019 demolish the existing building. And then we pick up at the beginning here with uh, December 10th, 2020, uh, the Land Use Control Board holds a public hearing on a comprehensive rezoning uh, as initiated by the Memphis City Council, uh, which has the authority to initiate comprehensive rezonings in accordance with the comprehensive plan of several parcels. Um, the Land Use Control Board recommended the rezoning of the subject parcel from CME 3, Commercial Mixed Use 3, to Mixed Use MU, um, which would prohibit the convenience store with gas pumps use. Uh, as we discussed before earlier in this meeting, the Mixed Use District had never been uh, applied outside of Uptown before. This was the first time it had been applied outside of Uptown. CMU 3 is a regional, as a commercial district meant to serve regional commercial needs, whereas MU um, requires that buildings be brought up to the street um, and also uh, allows, allows less auto-oriented uses. Um, so whereas CMU 3 would have permitted the proposed use, MU does not. Um, and that consideration was part of the reason that uh, City Council took up this rezoning. Uh, Mr. Motana did speak in opposition uh, at that public hearing at the Land Use Control Board. That same day, uh, Mr. Motana filed two building permit applications, one of which was closed as being an irrelevant application. 
Um, the other building permit application was filed that same day, same day December 10th. Um, it was not a complete application to my understanding. There were several missing documents and those were uh, continued to, those uh, were continued to be submitted over time from January 5th through February 21st. Um, and that's described here as well. On January 5th, the City Council approved the rezoning on a first reading, so three readings were required for the ordinance to be approved. Uh, on January 25th, uh, Ms. Hushiar, building plans reviewer, made comments on the proposed building permit application, noting that an administrative site plan review application would be required, uh, which is correct, an administrative site plan review application uh, would need to be approved prior to the uh, Construction Enforcement Department being able to uh, permit a, a building permit application. So the applications were submitted. Uh, that, that building permit application was not yet uh, the right application to submit. Um, the next day, uh, City Council approved the comprehensive rezoning on second reading according to the UDC's pending legislation doctrine. Uh, city officials are required to begin to observe that proposed legislation once it's been heard on second reading. Um, that same day, January 26, Mr. Motan applies for ASPR, Administrative Site Plan Review. Um, February 2nd, the City Council approves the comprehensive rezoning and the property is downzoned to mixed use. On February 4th, um, staff returns an initial markup of the ASPR to the uh, applicant's designer. Um, the Department of Construction Enforcement uh, was unaware at this time of the rezoning. So at this time, the, the ASPR application, from my perspective at least, should have been uh, stopped, paused, told, you know, this is now a no-go, you need to seek legislative approval, but they were not aware. So the review continued on. Um, in, even as far as to request an administrative deviation application, which was filed and approved. Um, I believe uh, that it was you know, approved legitimately uh, because the zoning was wrong. And then eventually, you know, this review continues. In Mar on March 8th, the staff reviewing the site plan uh, learns about the rezoning uh, and subsequently rejects the ASPR application. Uh, and Mr. Burke Renner uh, was the land use planner that was working on this ASPR, and he is uh, in the audience today. Should you have any questions on the details of this process more specifically? Here is the site plan itself. Um, so, in conclusion, and these are in your staff report as well, appellant and owner Motana Inc. has requested the reversal of the DPD decision to reject their proposed site plan of a convenience store with gas pumps in Highland Heights. Uh, in February 2021, the Memphis City Council rezoned this land from CMU3 to MU as part of a comprehensive rezoning of parts of Summer Avenue. The former zoning district would permit the proposed use by right in this location, whereas the latter does not. Um, According to the UDC's pending legislation provision, the zoning change took practical effect in January of that year after council's second reading. The appellant applied for administrative site plan review on the same day as that second reading. The UDC's vested rights provision states that a pending application is subject to zoning map or text amendments that are pending or approved during that application's review, unless that application has already resulted in an approved site plan or building permit, a site plan would have to come first for an application like this um, before you know that pending legislation takes effect. And in that case, the approval would stand despite the pending or approved legislation. So staff is of the opinion that number one, because the subject site has neither an approved site plan nor an approved building permit, the newer mixed use zoning applies. And in, in that case, staff is unable to approve the, the site plan. Uh, and number two, the request to retroactively approve a site plan under the authority of a former zoning district in order to retroactively vest the rights of that district is logically unsound. The appellant, and this is my best distillation of the appellant's arguments in uh, their letter of intent, disputes the administrative rejection of the site plan on two grounds. 
that number one, a staff member incorrectly indicated that administrative site plan review would not be required, thus leading them to apply for the building permit first instead, which caused a delay in time that might have been the, the cause that, that the uh, rights, according to staff, were not vested. And that number two, administrative site plan review exceeded the UDC's 10 working day limit on such review. Uh, I did put in the staff report relevant UDC provisions regarding both of those arguments, as well as some staff commentary on those provisions. Um, just in case you thought of it, the current council moratorium on new convenience source of gas pumps is of no consequence to this appeal. If the board retroactively approves the proposed site plan, the results in vested rights would take precedence over the moratorium, which was approved subsequent to the rezoning. Um, finally, the board, based upon its interpretation of the UDC, is authorized not only to approve or reject the appeal, and thus the site plan, but may also condition approval so as to bring the site plan into conformance with the UDC. And we also note that if rejected today, the applicant would be able to apply for legislative approval of a planned commercial development in order to authorize this convenience store. Uh, so our recommendation is to take whatever action the board deems appropriate and we did include the attested ordinance in this presentation slideshow and that commentary I mentioned in, in an appendix. Uh, thank you, I'm available for questions. And we have, again, Mr. Renner here and staff attorney as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Davis. Are there any questions of staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I, I have a question. The property re was rezoned MU, correct? And that property, that zoning district does not permit the use. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I, I was a little bit confused by number seven that said we could add conditions to bring the site into conformance. I, I don't, if the, the use so is not permitted. I, essentially, uh, you just have that option to add conditions to an approval if you decided to approve it. It's not just a yes you or no. You weren't saying specifically about this case. I, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions before we move to the applicant? All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Redlam, you want to come speak to us? Before my time starts, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have some handouts, please, sir. I'd like to yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Pences, do you mind helping him with those handouts? Just so you have 10 minutes to talk, we do have four other people to speak in support, but I imagine we probably want to hear more. From, we might need to hear more from you than from them. Uh, do you want me to tell you when you're at a certain point in your presentation to allow others to speak? Uh, yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, where, when, how much time do you want me to re reserve for them? Pardon? You want me to reserve a certain amount of time to tell you, hey, you're at. Yes, sir. Uh, three minutes. Reserve. Three minutes left. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll do that. I have several, couple more handouts. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for, uh, first of all, I'd like to discuss the application that was filed. Um, as, you, as you will see on the first page of my cover letter, uh, the, the professionals involved with this are John Roach, the architect, uh, Wesley Ashworth, civil engineer, Corey, Corey Brady, the landscape architect, 
and um, uh, Attorney Malcolm Fusey uh, assisted with the um, with the hearing brief filed on behalf of Ohana Incorporated. So you should have the original copy of the ap the application, the affidavit of Khalid Mothana, and a hearing brief. You have those three? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And you, you should also have a copy of the, uh, the drawings. Yes, sir. Okay. Plans. <clears throat> thank you for your service and your time this afternoon. Um, just a couple more comments about the application. The, the uh, timeline that's, is, that's in the staff report is different than the timeline in the application. The timeline in the application was attached to the zoning enforcement letter from Burke Renner dated the 13th of May, 2021. And, and so the timeline is different in the staff report than, the, than what's in the actual application. And finally, uh, there are three, the last three pages of the application were not included in the staff report. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you to please look at the uh, affidavit, please. Mm -hmm. And attached to the affidavit is a timeline. This is the true and actual timeline. <clears throat> and I'll try and go through it quickly. The site was purchased in April of 2013. It was bought from the land bank, the Shelby County Land Bank, the government land bank, sold this to Mr. Mathana. Now, when that happens, there is advertisement as to the, the availability of properties that the Shelby County Land Bank held, held, have for sale that goes out to the public. Um, Mr. Mathana was the highest bidder paid $65,000, actually it was more than $65,000 uh, for this particular property. Then in, in, on March 11, 2019, a demolition pit permit was applied for and approved by the Memphis and Shelby County Office of Construction, for, Construction uh, Enforcement. It was approved on March, in March 2019. In July of 2020, Mr. Mathana hired the architect to do the plans and specifications, and you have a copy of those. In, July, in uh, August, he hired the engineer to do site grading plans. In October, and, and we, we have now learned that the first pre-application conference with Mr. Renner, as discussed by Mr. Davis, occurred in September. September of 2020. Now, there's this, this uh, new uh, process that OPD or DPD has called a portal. And the citizen portal was opened in, on, in October, 21st of October, 2020. Now, uh, during the two meetings that Mr. Mathana had with Burke Renner prior to the application being filed, Mr. Renner reviewed the plans and and actually signed the plans and that uh, the copy of the plans I handed out to you are signed by Burke Renner. Now this is prior to the filing of the application. So he had a, a, a pre-application conference. <clears throat> now uh, on the 10th of, of uh, December, excuse me, on the 30th of November, I missed it very, this is the important date. The, um, the, oh, excuse me, the, the architect and site plans were final on the 18th of November. And this is after Mr. Renner gave comments about the site plan on the 18th of November, 2020. The engineer site plan, after incorporating the comments from Mr. Renner, were completed on the 20th of November, 2020. Uh, Mr. Mathana and the contractor, and the contractors here today filed the application on the 30th of November, 2020. And that uh, building permit application is a part of the original application filed in this case. And there's also a check in the, uh, in the application dated the 30th of November, 2020. 
And the check, by the way, the check was accepted, negotiated, and paid. So that's on the 30th of November, not the 10th of December. Then on the 10th of December, the citizen portal entry says, ASPR not required. ASPR not required. Moving on, the Land Use Control Board approved Z2010-10, and that's the map amendment on the 10th of December, 2020. Now, the citizen portal entry on the 11th of December um, uh, says it was assigned to MH. And, and, and here's one point that I, want, I would like everybody to remember. On the 30th of November, 2020, the zoning on this site was CMU3, and it was allowed, permitted by right. When he filed that application, it was permitted by right on that day. We're not asking for any, by the way, the, the language used by Mr. Davis, we're, asking, we're not asking for any retroactive uh, application. We're asking for the application at the time he filed the application. That's when, that's when it starts, is when, he, when uh, Mr. Mr. Mathana filed the application. There's no question that he was entitled to a building permit by right, and the use was allowed by right on the 30th of November, 2020. Uh, now, moving on, <clears throat> the on the 12th of December, 2020, the building permit electric was approved. On 29 December, that's that's seven minutes. That's seven minutes. I'll, I'll go but quickly. It's up, to, it's up to you. I mean, okay, I'll go quickly. Um, my the point is. Two different approvals, reviews, were approved in December. There were actually three because fire was approved on the 29th. Um, and then if you go on down to January 25th, that said, that's the first time Mr. Mathana found out that he had to file an ASPR. The first time. Now, if, if he had known to file an ASPR in December, and the staff has 12 days, including two days to respond, has 12 days to notify Mr. Mathana of the application, the results of the application of the ASPR. So now as to the, the zoning uh, change, that was not final until you look over on the next page, the second page of the timeline. <clears throat> it was approved um, in final form uh, the 11th of March, 2020, and, and uh, map zoning changes, along with text amendments, are not final according to the Memphis City Charter until you have three readings by the Memphis City Council, and the minutes are approved. They're sent to the chairman for signature, and then then the minutes are and the resolution or the ordinance is sent to the mayor. And that happened on the 11th of March. So now I want you to quickly go to the hearing brief, and you'll see the three issues on the first page. And we're asking that you uh, approve the appeal based on those three issues. And please read the conclusion on page seven. And I'll save the remaining time for, um, if I have any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions right now for Mr. Brittenham? Seeing none. Okay. And we have, I have, we have about a minute left. Okay. And I have four people here to speak in support if they want to come speak. Is there Not, any opposition, Mr. Chair? There is uh, opposition. There's one, one thing of opposition. So if there's anybody in support that wants to speak, or you could also give your minute to Mr. Brittenham. He's trying to save you some time. So this is just support. I will have some rebuttal time then, correct? Yeah, you have two minutes of rebuttal unless they don't speak now. Thank and you. you can have three. All right, ma'am, if you'll give your name and address for the record. My name is Pearly Mosby. I live at 3174 Rangeline Road, Memphis, Tennessee, 38127. 
Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the true stuff you got? The whole truth. All right, go ahead, Miss Mosley. Mosby, well, I'm sorry. Uh, just like I said, I'm here to represent them. And uh, I have been homeless, uh, eating out the garbage can, and they have been a great help to us. They bought us beds. And uh, we need a roof. Our roof is caving in, and they have blessed, they are blessing us with the roof. And would you please uh, approve them? Okay. That was quick. That was 20 seconds. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Mosby? Hearing none. Thank you, ma'am. Um, does someone else want to come talk? I have a Ch Ms. Chen. Okay, if you'll come up here and give your name and address for the record. Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Patsy Chen. Um, okay. I would like to give the actual... Um, Go ahead. Oh, give, uh, give your name and address for me. Okay. My name is Patsy Chen. Okay. Uh, the address, or the working address, is um, 1110 Faxon Avenue, Memphis, Tennessee, 31105. Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self you got? I do. All right, go ahead, Ms. Chen. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to say uh, firsthand, and I speak for um, uh, in support of uh, Ms. Mosby, that uh, Mr. Uh, Madonna has been a great, great help in the community. And uh, we, uh, Darkness to Light is a women and children's center, and he has supported the people there, the homeless um, mothers with children. Uh, we, he, he supported us with beds. Uh, he supported us with, uh, as far as getting a new roof, helping to get us a new roof for the center. And also in the community where he's, um, I wanted to sign or put the um, property. Uh, we are be we will be doing uh, ministry work there. We'll be feeding uh, as far as with the homeless. Uh, we're opening up a uh, or launching uh, feed uh, the God, feed God sheep. I'm sorry, so that we can help in that community. So it will be a great um, benefit for the homeless. It'll be a great benefit for the community. Uh, if you all will approve this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Are there any questions for Mrs. Chen? Seeing none, thank you so much. Okay, with Ms. Chen uh, speaking with us, we ran through our 10 minutes for the support. So we're going to move on to the opposition. So if I could have, uh, is it four lines? Is that the last name? Okay. Yeah, if you could come and give your name and address for the record. Uh, it's come to my attention that there are others here that would like to speak in opposition, but they did not complete a comment card. Is that possible? It, it is. We'll just have them state their name and address for the record. So, yeah. Can, can they go first, please? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Ma'am, if you'll give your name and address for the record, and I'll swear okay. you in. My name is Jasmine Tricochi. My address, working address, is 3397 Summer Avenue. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Will you do me a favor and say your last name for me again? I just didn't. I did Try Kochi. It's going to be spelled T R I C O C H E. Okay, Try Kochi. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, so I'm just going to read a letter that I had. So it says, this letter is on behalf of Dream Life and the Dream Center event venue. We are located at 3397 and 3399 Summer Avenue. We are new tenants in the neighborhood. As tenants in the Heights neighborhood, we are not in favor of yet another gas station being put in our neighborhood. A gas station does not stimulate economic growth or development in this area. There are many gas stations on Summer Avenue and another one may, may too become an eyesore just as some of them are now. 
We are new tenants in this neighborhood and we have invested over $25,000 in renovations on our two spaces that sit directly across from the property in question. We are truly in, not in favor of this decision. We work closely with Drew, which is our landlord, which recently just purchased the property that we have. The city of Memphis as a SBE, a MBE, and LOSB to improve the area and its economic growth and development. Approving a gas station will promote loitering and unwanted traffic and attention may cause a standstill for all the improvements and projects that are currently in place for economic growth and development in our own community. Please consider the tenants and residents in the area that actually will be affected by this addition. In addition, um, there's a safety concern to increase traffic that may impede on the fire department you guys, guys spoke about with their ability to be able to enter and exit fast, which of course a matter of seconds can determine life or death. Lastly, to mention 3.0 plan that opposes gas stations in this lo at locations like this. The businesses like myself that owns a new business in the area and residents are trying to improve the area and too much crime blight and loitering accompanies gas stations. Um, there are several gas stations immediately in the vicinity and would not increase their property value. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for Ms. Uh, Tricochi? All right, thank you, ma'am, for coming down. Is there other people here to speak, or just is it Mr. Four Lines? Are you ready? If you can give your name and address for the record for me. Dane Four Lines, my uh, residence is at 3450 Tutwiler Avenue. Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the true stuff you got? I do. All right, go ahead, Mr. Four Lines. Uh, so the Highland Heights neighborhood has persevered um, in spite of uh, shifting investment priorities to new suburban areas over the past several decades. Um, and the used car lots, tire shops, and gas stations have become emblematic of the decline of the neighborhood. But that downward trajectory is changing. Recent redevelopment efforts, both public and private, are consistent with desires expressed by Heights area residents for economic development, historic preservation, uh, a greater variety of goods and services, and improved walkability. The recent rezoning of this area of summer, the Accelerate Memphis plan, the Heights Line project, and the nearly $3 million investment in the storefronts on the southeast corner of summer and national reflect these priorities and have the potential to lead to further economic development and continued revitalization of the community. Um, I'm the Special Projects Director with the Heights Community Development Corporation, and we are strongly opposed to the development of gas station at 3375 Summer. Another auto-oriented business in this stretch of summer will undermine the many efforts underway to reestablish this area as a walkable mixed-use neighborhood center, not to mention creating a potential negative environmental condition for the future. A gas station at this location directly conflicts with the vision of community members as expressed in the 3.0 plan, the 10 opposition, opposition letters that you received in the staff report, and the Heights CDC's ongoing engagement efforts. Beginning in 2015, the Heights CDC began reaching out to the property owner and its representatives about this site to offer support for redeveloping what at that time was a historic mixed-use brick building. In the six years since, uh, the Heights CDC has contacted the owners of their representatives at least eight times, wanting to engage in a discussion regarding ways in which the property could be redeveloped for mutual benefit, not only for the owners, but for the community. Even after the property was put up for sale, the owner repeatedly declined to enter into any conversation with the Heights CDC about the property's potential use. As mentioned by other concerned citizens, a gas station offers very little in the way of community benefit. Nine gas stations already exist within a half mile, uh, alongside a complete lack of other basic goods and services like grocery stores and banks. Um, since the consideration today distills down to uh, UDC provisions, um, I, I believe the gas station proposal is too little too late. Um, in August of 2020, Council approved uh, a request for OPD to consider rezoning of this corridor. And although the NU zoning has only recently been into effect, it corrected a CMU zoning that probably never should have been applied in the first place. 
and essentially rendered the historic built environment along this stretch of summer obsolete, thus contributing to its past decline. It could also be said that the classification of Broad Avenue as an ur urban major collector is outdated, likely a holdover from before the days that Sam Cooper turned Broad into a 1.8 mile road that carries less than 4,000 cars a day and dead ends near Hollywood. If Broad Avenue were properly classified today, it's likely a gas station at this corner would require a special use permit anyway per UDC guidelines. It doesn't seem like there's much reason to approve this project or the appeal. So please uphold the decision to reject the proposal to build a gas station on this site. Thank you. All right, are there any questions for Mr. Fourlines? Thank you, sir, appreciate your time. Mr. Uh, Brentnum, you have two uh, minutes of rebuttal. Thank you. I have more handouts. Okay, go for it. What you're seeing in the picture is the building when it was purchased by Mr. Mathan. And, and by the way, the last speaker talked about approaching the owners. Uh, Mr. Mathan says that didn't happen. Um, I want to touch a minute on the. Uh, The point he made about the um, uh, the the uh, when this property was approved for sale by the Shelby County Commission in 2013. The only bidder, excuse me, not the only bidder, but the highest bidder was Mr. Matheny. No one appeared from any CDC in that area to object to the sale to Mr. Matheny in 2013 when the county commission approved the sale. That's what the minutes say. No one appeared. And now the, uh, the CDC appears and says, oh, the government sold you this, but now we want the government to take it away from you. And that's what he's asking you to do. We say that's wrong. And, and he said it's too little, too late. This is right on time. When, he, when Mr. Matheny filed the application, it was CMU3, which allowed gas stations by right. The issue is, how long did um, the staff take to review this? And they took too long. They took entirely too long. And the, the, uh, just a couple comments. If you will look at the, the affidavit on page five, please look at the affidavit on page five. Speaking of economic development, this is how much money Mr. Matheny and his business has invested in this property to date, $150,000. Now, upon completion, the taxes and the permit fees yearly is $140,000 that goes back to the government. So, uh, and, and what we'd like you to do is to please consider the fact that Mr. Matheny, at the time he filed his application and all the work that he did and the money he spent getting up to the point of applying for the application, he, he did every step right every step right, and he should be allowed to have this building permit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Brennan, uh, Robert Rowland County Attorney's Office and attorney for the board. Uh, Mr. Brennan, I, I just want to clarify one thing you just said, please. Um, uh, I understood you to say that Mr. Um, that the owner, pays $140,000 in taxes annually? Once the, the uh, gas station is complete, okay. it, will, it will generate $140,000 a year in taxes and, and fees. Now, if, you want, if you're asking what has he paid since he purchased the property, well, I think you've answered the question. I yes. You well, that's, it's it thirty something thousand dollars. Yes, sir. It's currently a vacant uh, lot, correct? Pardon? It's currently a vacant lot. That's true. Uh, okay. 
Yes, it's currently a, a vacant property, and uh, the property taxes right now are city and county are fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars a year that he has paid every year on time since two thousand thirteen. Thank you, Mr. Question, Chairman, Mr. Roy. At the appropriate time, I, I wonder if I could, uh, we got a lot of information here. I wonder if I could uh, expand the record just a little bit by asking a few questions uh, whenever you find that's appropriate. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we find it's appropriate now. Okay. Mr. Um, Davis, I would ask you, um, on page seven of the staff report in your chart, you have the... Uh, approval of the Summer Avenue rezoning beginning in December of 2020, going to early February of uh, this year. Uh, during that, the hearings before the Land Use Control Board and the hearings before each of the three readings at City Council for an ordinance, ordinance takes three readings, uh, did the Land Use Control Board or the City Council or OPD, or LUDs now, did you, um, were gas stations a concern in the rezoning of Summer Avenue? Uh, yes. So before, what, what it doesn't show on this table is in order for a comprehensive rezoning to be applied for, um, City Council has to approve a resolution requesting that that application be submitted. Uh, and what spurred that initial comprehensive zone rezoning uh, application initiation uh, by council was uh, a gas station proposed on Summer Avenue. So yes. And did uh, who specifically brought that up? Was it city councilman? Or uh, yes, uh, Councilman Carlisle specifically, but the city council in general. Okay. Now. Uh, this was a city ordinance. I'm a county attorney, so I wasn't involved. Um, just, just reading through the newspaper, which everyone knows, uh, the churches along Summer Avenue, the demolition of the churches, uh, I understood that that began the process. Yeah, so a, a moratorium was passed by city council that uh, on, on the demolition of churches, of, a, of church buildings of a certain age, um, along with this uh, request for planning staff to look at uh, ways to reduce development pressure on those churches. Uh, and we ended up expanding the scope of our recommendation to uh, recommend the comprehensive rezoning, not only of those church parcels, but of uh, longer stretches of Summer Avenue in two different places um, to uh, essentially create a more physically integrated uh, zoning district that, that did uh, allow fewer auto-oriented uses. And do you recall at what point concerns about uh, gas stations were voiced? Could you repeat that question? At, at what point in that process were these concerns about gas stations raised? For, at, at, I would say at the beginning, that the concerns about gas stations were present from the beginning of the request for planning staff to begin looking at ideas to uh, address this issue of the, the church and the church moratorium. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to object to this line of questioning of staff member by the county attorney, um, particularly about the, the content and the uh, discussion about what happened at the Land Use Control Board. Now, if you wanted to ask him about the Land Use Control Board when it was rezoned to CMU-3, I'm, I'm fine with that. But the horse is out the barn if he's talking, if he's asking questions about the, this so-called rezoning to MU. That's not an issue here. Because as the county attorney says, it takes three readings and it has to be sent to the mayor before it's effective. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parliamentarian, I've never really had an objection to have to deal with, so I would rely on you on how to, <laughs> what I'm supposed to do here, possibly. But I do, but to me, I do understand the objection being what we're talking about is timing of the application versus when it went through. Uh, and that's really what we're deciding today, correct? In essence, which zoning district should apply to this application? Right. And that all goes to which 
moment in time should we have or works. did we consider it complete? And I think the appellant would say, when should that date should have been? Because we still haven't approved the site plan. Right, right. Okay. Um, note taken, but if you, do you have any other questions? That was my last question, but um, just to respond, um, the, the reason for denial was that the zoning had changed. That's, the, of course, the right. relevance. Understood. Understood. So, how about this? I have a question for Sir Britton. Um, Thank you. When would you say you should have had your vet, and I'm sure you've told me this before, there's okay. been a lot of dates involved. It, sure. When did, what date would you say we, sh we should have had our vested rights had the city or county moved appropriately on this? If you look at the affidavit timeline, uh -huh. and, and it says application for building permit CMU3 zoning, 30 November 2020. There's no question, and I believe Mr. Davis and Mr. Whitehead and Mr. Rowling will agree on that date, the zoning was for this site was CMU-3. There's no dispute about that. So at the time he filed his application, a gas station or convenience store with gas pumps was allowed by right, was permitted. And in your in the in the hearing brief, uh, there is a an exhibit that has a copy of the zoning plan, excuse me, the, the uh, zoning map, which says CMU-3 and there is a copy of the use table that shows CMU-3 is permitted by right. Now, if you need, okay, I can well, take let a me, minute let me, to find Let me that. back up. I understand okay. that date. Yes, sir. But we, I'm looking for either the date we had a, we don't have an approved site plan, because y'all, you would, you would contend that you weren't told you needed one in time, and we don't have a building permit. So I'm trying to get the, I don't really care when you apply for the building permit, if, if that building permit was applied for properly, and I'll, I'll take that as fact on the yes, 30th, sir. when do you think you should have had your building permit? And you're, you're basically saying the county moved too slow. If they had moved at the right speed, we would. and that's the date I'm looking for. Okay. Does well, that make sense? If, if you look at the, um, the building codes, the building codes now, not the UDC, but the sure. building codes says when you file it, when an applicant files an application, on that day, the building code says the building official has a reasonable time to respond and then must respond in writing. And, and in this case, that happened. On the 10th of December, sure. the building official through the portal said, no, it says ASPR not required. Yet, and, and, and pursuant to that, the application was continued to be reviewed. It got the uh, it got it got electric, fire, and plumbing approved uh, before it, all in uh, December, all in December 2020. Now and then you see ASP ASPR required in the portal note. The 25th of January, 2021. Now, if the ASPR was told to Mr. Mathana on the 10th of December, the UDC says that the, that the building official or the zoning administrator has 10 days in which, 10 working days, in which to review the application. So that would have been 10 December. And then the, the building official has two days to inform the applicant in writing of the decision. That never happened. So even if you, if you say the ASPR is required, you have to move it up to 10 December, and then 12 days from that would be the date that it would be approved. And that's well before the action of the city council and what staff is saying, two readings, 
but that's contrary to the city charter. City charter requires three readings and it has to be sent to the mayor before it's effective. Uh, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Brennan. Yes, sir. So you're saying that he had all his approvals before you found out about the ASPR? Yes, sir. No, sir. That, that's not according to your timeline now. Well, wait a minute. Because, no, no, let me have this. Okay. You said that you got a building permit for electrical, city fire, but what about the other reviews that take place within code enforcement, such as mechanical and plumbing? Yes, sir. I don't see the approval of those. So, had that... Does it? Plumbing's there. Plumbing and electrical. Well, I misunderstood okay, so your question. Your mechanical approval. I misunderstood your question. I thought you said... Anyway, whatever you, whatever you said, I misunderstood you. What, but what I asked you was, did he have all the oh, approvals? Oh, no, sir. No, sir. Okay. So if you don't have all the approvals, may I ask this question then? What made your client move forward with the administrative site plan review knowing he had a CMU3 zoning, which is an approval by right? Correct. Why That's, did he do that? Because he was told... If you look at the at the timeline attached to the affidavit, on the 10th of December, he was told ASPR not required. Yes, sir. All right. Then on the 25th of January, 2021, he said he receives a note saying ASPR required. Yes, sir. That's my my question is right there. Yeah. Why did he move forward with an administrative site plan review with plans and a check? Why didn't he question it at that point? Well, he did. And that's with who? With staff, and Mr. Burke Renner. The staff is really very much aware of this situation. But if you, if, what if you, if you look at this timeline, when it, when it said ASPR not required, staff continued to staff, and, I, and we have to distinguish between the building official and, the, and the, uh, what they call downtown is zoning administration. Yeah, I'm, but the I'm building clear. official continued to process the building permit application after 10 December 2020. But that's not unusual. Uh, I agree. So you're stating the obvious. That's not unusual. Yeah. So take me a little further. Right. Okay, well, taking you further to the ASPR required on the 25th of January. The next day he files the ASPR. And so my that's question the is, clock. why did he do that? If he knew he didn't have to, that's my question. Because he he was told he had to. That's okay. the answer. He was told you have to file an ASPR according to the portal entry. Okay. And, and, and what I, what's significant about that is, if you start the ten days from the twenty fifth, that, that that staff has to respond um, and add the two days. That takes you into early January, which is still before the the so-called rezoning became effective. And, and one other one other aspect about this, and and uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Rowling have brought it up. Burke Renner was working with the applicant, Mr. Matheny, since September of 2020. If a if an ASPR should have been filed. Mr. Renner and, and all the other code officials sh should have tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, file with, the, file with, a, with your building permit, file an ASPR. Mr. Renner signed the, the, the plans that, you, that I, printed, I showed out to you or presented to you. And that was back in September, October. And, and his signature of the plan indicates what he reviewed to you the, and your client? He reviewed the plan. Mr. Renner reviewed the plans. Okay. No, the, the ASP, the first time my client heard the, the, uh, the letters ASPR or saw or read the, those letters was the 25th of January. So when did Mr. Renner sign the plans? September, he didn't, he didn't date them, but it was one of those meeting, pre-application meetings uh, between Mr. Renner and Mr. Matheny. Mr. Renner admits 
he started working with Mr. Methane in September of 2020. And, and, and speaking of vested rights, what the case law says, and that's in the brief, the case law says when an applicant has has spent the kind of uh, resources that, that Mr. Methaney has, $150,000, he has done all this work, he cleared the property, and you saw what the property looked like prior to clearing. He put in all of this effort, he owned the profit, property, he, he expended uh, uh, time, effort, and money, and the case law says when that happens, you have vested rights when you file your application. I, I've submitted to you um, in the brief, the last page or two, last couple pages, the case law on it. Okay. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, I have a question for staff. Yes, yes sir. <clears throat> staff, can you tell me when there was talk of the moratorium situation on Summer Avenue? Can you give me a month and year on that? Oh, uh, well, there, there's two moratoria. Uh, there's one specific to gas stations, and that's citywide. And that happened after most of the events that we've described. The, the one that is, was specific to Summer Avenue was probably passed in July or August of last year-ish. That sounds right. And that was against the demolition of certain places of worship. So that, too, did not apply directly to this site. It was mainly focused at the Highland Heights Methodist a couple blocks to the east at a, at a Highland. And it didn't specifically name gas stations in that first moratorium you speak to? That is correct, although uh, the, there was a proposal to build a gas station where Highland Heights Methodist is. So there was a relationship to gas stations, but that was the limitation of it. And that was in July of 2020, roughly. Last summer, roughly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there other, other questions? Yes, sir. Is there any intent in replacing the sidewalk and curb cuts around this piece of property? Whatever the, whatever the requirements are to um, uh, complete the work, the answer is yes. Well, we anticipate that. You will have to do an ASPR. You're on a state route. We have signed a memorandum of understanding between them and the city. That memorandum of understanding does not involve this board. And the best you're going to do on summer is a right in, right out curb cut. So uh, you better get a plan made up and try to figure out how to make that work. Y yes, sir. We, we will comply. The appeals process for that is done through the state, and you will have to produce a traffic impact study and a safety study, which yes, you will have to show that you are not making any more dangerous at that intersection. Yes, sir. We understand. Uh, and you're saying that because uh, Summer Avenue is at U.S. Highway 70? Yes, sir. The U.S. Highway 70, as everyone knows, was originally constructed in the mid-30s, 1930s. Yes, and it's, it's a, I understand. It's an east, it's a east coast to west coast highway, and so it's it's known and has a history of, and tradition of gas stations. Yes, sir. You, I made a note when you said it was on the internet, so I made a note of it. Thank you, sir. Yes, we, we intend to comply, and, and to Mr. Whitehead's point, the, the review process process has not been completed it just stopped so we we want to complete the uh, review process and if you want to condition it to that the review process has to happen within a certain time that's fine because we knew we had to uh, complete the review process before we could get our billing permit. I have a question. Uh, Mr. Jackson. So Mr. Brindham, so what so are you saying that your client did know that an administrative site plan review was required because it was on Highway 70? No, no sir. That's not what I said. I was, I was I'm, I'm asking. No, sir. That's no, not. Sir. Okay. 
That's all I'm saying. But now you know one would have been required, whether it was CMU or MU. As okay. soon as we were informed and an ASPR is required, we applied for it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? And, and Mr. Chairman, I think it may behoove the, the body to um, understand that there is there are some, there are many building permits that do not turn on the requirement for ASPR. ASPR is a separate and parallel permitting process, and it's governed by uh, 4.1 of the UDC. And I believe the individual in uh, the, the 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 history that indicated that a ASPR was not required was our planning tech, Jordan Johnson, who among other duties uh, seeks to determine if we have quorums for this board. So she wears many hats, but she is not the building official, uh, number one. Number two, 4.1 of the UDC, this section that turns on, that makes certain building permits require that parallel application, ASPR, for commercial properties, it requires ASPR for all new construction and facilities. So it seems like the question may be, uh, why wasn't this flagged earlier, perhaps? Uh, but the UDC clearly, for a new sh commercial structure or a new residential structure, uh, requires ASPR. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts by the board? All right, hearing none. May I respond to that comment? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's the pattern and practice and tradition when you go to the code instruction, code enforcement office, you file a building permit. Then the building official informs you when an ASPR is required. And, and Mr. White is, is correct. That's, that is the particular site citation in the UDC that says when an, when an ASPR is required. However, the building official informs the applicant after the building permit application is received and reviewed, then the building official informs the applicant ASPR required. And that's what happened here. It just happened late. Mr. Johnson. Well, Mr. Brent, that doesn't seem unusual because I wouldn't think the building official would know that an ASPR would be required only because it's on a state route. That I can see how that's been overlooked. Can't you? Well, I was just I was uh, making uh, reference to the UDC provision that Mr. Whitehead talked about. I was not making reference to you with the city engineer, right? I was not making reference to the city engineer's point. I was making reference to Mr. Whitehead's point. Okay. All right. Any thank other, you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, sir. For your service. Any other questions? Mr. Jackson? Mr. Secretary, can you tell me where we are in the whole process of this? The the building permit, has it not has it been denied or not denied, or has the process just stopped? Once it was determined, once there was a decision made by whatever powers that be, uh, probably some conjunction between my department and the building department, that we, the, the zoning had changed. That was, our, that was our finding, our determination to MU stopped. And, it's, uh, and at that point, we said, you need to rezone the property, file a plan development. If you think you've been wronged, file a variance. Uh, or if you have a, a dispute with the timeline, file an appeal. Okay. So at this point, the building department has gone no further based on what you just said. That is correct. Thank you. All right, I got a question for you, too. So let's say they do their ASPR. And then that isn't necessarily approved. Like that's the approval of the site plan, right? I think I know what the ASPR is, but I'm not sure. Um, how, so you have 10 days to respond. Is that usually a response of approval or you have more stuff to do? Like is like where were they on that? Uh, and how long does it how does how does it generally take to get approval of a site plan? 
Um, let me defer. We have some staff that do this on a daily. Uh, Mr. Thomas, can you approach the, the, the podium? If you had to give an average number of days, and I'd also like Mr. Renner to, to respond as, as you approach the, the podium here. What is the average number of days it takes to approve your average ASPR? Commercial. Uh, I guess, so for commercial, I mean, I generally more review commercial building applications. That generally could take between, depending on my workflow, one to three days, in which case, if it's a special purpose district ASPR, I send it to Mr. Saliba, uh, Norman Saliba, who then will assign it to one of the staff members, or Mr. Renner, special purpose districts being Midtown Overlay, Medical District, those types of things. If I make the determination that it's a new commercial structure, then those are done by Mr. Renner, and I will send them his way through a cell app to generate how it goes. So, good segue. On. Mr. Renner, uh, on average, and, and I, oh, let me ask first question first. Uh, how often do you review an ASPR and then you seek additional information? Percentage. It's half the time. And so that was one of your questions. Yes. And then, so including that half and the half that you don't have that, would you say we we generally take one, two, three, four weeks to complete oh, an ASPR? It, it can be as short as a week if it's complete, but I've seen it run two years because the project's on hold for one reason or another from a financing standpoint till it's actually complete. So on average, we're right about a month for most of the applications. Okay, thank you. So about a month is usually okay. what it takes us to review ASPR okay. of, of a commercial. Okay. helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Hearing none, I assume you guys are ready to vote or discuss further. Do we have a motion to approve BOA 21-62? So moved. Second. Being moved and seconds, any discussion? Okay, so we are Is there any? I have an opinion, discussion, most of the group, yes. Yeah, go ahead, <coughs> Jackson. <laughs> From what I can gather, the application for this gas station was submitted under the time frame, it was CME, pretty clear. Based on what the city engineer's office has said, there is an administrative site plan review required because it's on state route. So until that administrative site plan has been approved, there can be no building permit. So from what I see, that process should pick up and move forward from that. It should be a conversation between the applicant and staff to get an administrative site plan review that is approved. Once that's approved, I would think it would go back to the building department for the continuance of issuing the building permit. But based on what the city engineer said, there are also a lot of requirements they come with that administrative site plan review. Traffic counts, traffic studies, and all those things. That's my opinion from what I see. So the yes vote is for just for the appeal. So that's what I need a clarification on, Ms. Dawson. The You're yes right. vote is just for the appeal. The, the yes vote would basically say we think they filed what they needed to in a timely manner. I guess what I think what I'm basing my is here's what, I'll give you my opinion. Mm -hmm. That helps. If I take as fact that they could have filed their ASPR on the 10th of December, had they had they known, instead of it saying in the portal, none required, mm -hmm. whether or not they knew they should have done it or not, if I see something in the portal that says none required, you somewhat seem to rely on the city for that. Uh, whether, if, even if you should have known, because we're all judged to know what the UDC and every bit of it says. It seems to me if most are done in 30 days, they would have been done with their ASPR and had vested rights when the council made their decision. And that's the only thing I'm looking at. I don't necessarily care if there's a, I mean like, I do care if there's a gas station there. Probably rather there not be a gas station there, but I think they were doing things as they were kind of told to do based on that, but I could be wrong. 
Am I? No, I think, I think you're right. The only thing I question is, is the time frame to get the ASPR done based on the fact that it's got to go in front of the, you got to get a traffic study done, the traffic council, and all that. I don't think that could have been done in 30 days. But I do think that they filed in time and should pick up and move forward. Is okay. basically, I think, what you're saying. Is that correct? I think they. I think if they would have filed on the tenth, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that the system would have worked to get it approved in time. Not the the like if they had just done it right before they they needed to, they needed to have it approved, not just filed before the city moved on it enough to, through like the second reading or third reading. And I think that they could have. I can't tell you if they did or would or wouldn't have. But I think they could have done it, and it looks like they were moving forward quickly as they were told to do things. I have a question for Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, if they file the application under CMU before the third reading, does that mean they go under CMU? Yes or no? I'm going to answer your question, but I want, I'm going to give a kind of a long answer. So because this comes up, this, this issue of a use um, being permitted by right and maybe uh, after the fact, after someone gets an idea to utilize that use by right on a piece of property, the city says, oh, we didn't think of that there. This has been happening for 100 years in Tennessee. Uh, oh, we didn't think of that. So th on one side, you have this principle of uh, vested rights. When does a person's right vest? And under uh, a 1939 or 40 Supreme Court, Tennessee Supreme Court holding, you needed your building permit and then some substantial furtherance of that building permit. Uh, well, so for a long time, we were a late vesting state because you had to get both a permit and then some kind of construction uh, based upon that permit. In 2014, the General Assembly said, we shouldn't be a late vesting state. We are a ideologically, ideologically conservative state, and most ideologically conservative states are early vesting states. And so let's change the case law. Let's trump the case law with statutory law. And in 2014, the General Assembly said, all you need is a permit, a building permit, or an approved site plan. You don't have to have any construction. In fact, you can wait 10 years before you commence construction. That's how serious we are at becoming an early vesting state, said the General Assembly. Well, in the meantime, the city is over here saying, well, what are we going to do about that? Now we're looking at a different Supreme Court uh, opinion, out of, also out of Nashville. All of this comes out of Nashville because it's growing so fast, I guess. Uh, another case out of Nashville that said, hey, when does the time, when does the clock start? Is it the, the zoning in place at the time the building permit was issued? Or if we realize, oh, we didn't know you could do that there, let's try to rezone that property before you can get a building permit. So that's where we are now. And the answer to that question, at least under this uh, Harding Academy, Harding University case out of Nashville, the Supreme Court said, so long as a matter is sufficiently pending, a city may apply the future zoning. May. That's key. And I think that, that's really what this body is impaneled to determine. When is May fair and when is May not fair? Right? So in, uh, in the Harding Academy case, they said sufficiently pending. Yeah, but it has to be, you know, it has to not just be pending, but sufficiently pending. We have codified that in the UDC to say two readings by city council is sufficient. We went ahead and defined it because the Supreme Court did not. So when do you have a vested right? You have a vested right when you have any approval, site plan or building from the city, so long as the new rule coming down the pike hadn't, hadn't gotten to second reading. This case does not match up to that so cleanly. And that's why you know, everybody is falling on on the 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 uh, wisdom of this body to split that baby. Good luck with that. Um, so to, to restate my point after that, the way I understand it, 
Had they known on the 10th when it said no S SPR needed and filed on the 11th when it, and that it was needed, that gave them 45 days before the second reading and approval. And given that most are approved or, you know, 30 days, it seems like they probably would have been approved. Mr. Had Chair, they known that. We, this, it's a, may I make a point? Yes, please. Um, we don't need to speak in hypotheticals here uh, because the applicant did apply for ASPR. Um, and although the ASPR um, was applied for the same day that pending legislation or second reading took effect, the reviewers were not aware of that. So it proceeded down the path of review uh, and we have sort of delineated uh, what happened there on in this table. So on the 26th of January, ASPR was applied for. Um, on the 4th of February, so about a week later, uh, staff returned its initial markup or comments. Um, it was, and those comments basically said you need an administrative deviation uh, for an encroachment into Broad Avenue, the Broad Avenue setback. That administrative deviation application was filed about three weeks later um, and then approved one week after that. Again, the pending legislation, and by this point, third reading had happened. Um, a revised ASPR application was submitted March 2nd. The initial was submitted January 26th. And then on March 8th, the reviewers learned about the, the rezoning uh, and rejected it within a couple days. Boom. 43 days, something like that. So right on it. So that didn't, that helped, but not a ton. <laughs> like it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the dagger. Um, okay, any other thoughts before we vote? And if I may answer Ms. Doss's question, a yes vote says the applicant uh, should enjoy the zoning district of CNU 3, and he would complete the ASPR process as if he was zoned CNU 3. And no vote says, no, we're going to consider this property to have been zoned MU, and you have to adhere to MU. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. You know, I'm listening to you, uh, Mr. Jackson, and others about this, but, but, you know, there's also the way of looking at this to me is that he applied for the ASPR when he applied for it, regardless of what was told to him before. And, you know, it, it's just the way uh, business gets conducted, and there's no. Um, uh, intention on the part of the uh, public administrators, you know, to keep him from getting a gas station there. To me, the the time frame just fell the way it did. Th that's how I have been looking at it. And, uh, you know, and because it fell the way it did, and he filed the ASPR on the same day that the second reading was approved, oh, he... I, he's got a lot of other things he could do with that property and, and to me and it's a good and valuable location getting better he hadn't built anything uh, so anyway I, I think I, that's a different way from how you've been yeah, looking no, it's at an it. absolutely valid point so yeah um, any other comments before we vote hearing none Mr. Whitehead would you give us a roll call please Mr. Claybrook Yes. Ms. Baker? No. Ms. Doss? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Malazar? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. That's five eyes and one nay. All right. Thank you for coming down. Thank Mr. you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Brennan. Yeah, uh, Mr. Why don't we call our next case for us? Yes, sir. And, and as I do that, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to give this body some good news. Starting July 19th, we will be reviewing, my staff um, uh, will make an, every attempt to review every new permit to square it with 4.1. So I hope that you will not see a lot of 4.1 issues in the future. And, and whether they were required or not. Item 12 is docket BOA 2165, located at 541 Perkins Extended. 
The applicant is Sydney Lazaroff Family Limited Partnership, represented by Brenda Solomita Baser. The use district is the CMU3. And Mr. Chairman, the variant is from 4915, <laughs> let's say it all together, F1C, to allow the reuse of two signs that have been abandoned for more than 365 days. All right, we were hoping for another one of these. Uh, Mr. Skinner, you want to give us like a super brief overview, and then we'll go to Ms. Salamito so she can distinguish from other cases we've heard today? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Uh, so Lucas Skinner with the Office of Planning and Development. Um, again, another, uh, the last signed case for the day. Uh, this is at 541 Perkins Extended. Uh, zoning map, the orange stars indicate the two signs that this case will deal with. Um, so this is located just south of the Poplar and Perkins Extended uh, intersection. The few site photos. Um, kind of gives a broad overview of the site. There's, there are multiple signs um, on this site, and we can get into that in a minute. These are the two in question. Um, one taller, uh, the Magic Wireless sign is uh, 29 feet in height and 80 square feet, and the Catherine sign to the left is 25 feet in height and 81 square feet. I realize you can't see that on the screen, but that's what those numbers say. Um, conclusions here, um, found on page 11, um, I am recommending rejection on this case, and um, Mrs. Solomon Baser and I agreed on a fourth condition to be added if um, it is approved. That would read uh, something to the effect um, that the applicant shall return after six months to show a new design for the signs. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I'm available for any questions. Will you repeat that? Uh, yeah. The, the additional six-month condition? Just yes, so just, so just that the applicant shall return after six months to show a new design for the signs. Okay. All right. Uh, are there any questions of staff before we move on? Ms. Solomita, will you up? Or Solomita Baser. I always leave all the Baser. I'm terrible. Um, if you'll give your name and address for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brenda Salamito Baser, 1779 Kirby Parkway, Memphis. Okay, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so you got? I do. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Talk to us. Uh, we bit. are in agreement, applicant, uh, with staff, that they're agreeing to take down the signs if we have the ability to come back in six months with a sign that either conforms or this mostly conforms to the, the district regulations. But because it's an older property and you can kind of see it's, um, you know, there are actually three signs on the property, but one received a, that Platinum Jewelers received a full variance uh, a few years ago. So it's the other two that are in question. So we'll come take those down and within six months come back with a design for a new sign that conforms for the tenants. And because there's some tenants on the back side of the building as well. Okay, just to understand, so the signs are coming by down now, or you're saying give us six months to figure this out? Is that to get little... a plan and, and okay. get it, get it. And, and we are here as a result of a court citation. Okay. So, and that's why we're asking, you know, in Catherine's, it's, it's been vacant. Um, and so if the owners can, can pull together uh, a sign design, and, and they're currently leasing, trying to lease those vacant spaces. Okay, okay. understood. Uh, are there any questions for Ms. Uh, Solomita Baser? Go ahead, yeah, Mr. Baser. Um, Ms. Baser, quick question. Sure. So what you're saying is, when you come back in six months, you'll come back with one sign that replaces all three signs? No, so just the two. Just the two we saw. Just the two. Because Catherine the, the platinum, magic sale. Yeah, the platinum jewelers received a full variance um, two or three years ago. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, do you want to say anything, Mary? Are we voting on this or uh, we've we... not even made it to discussion yet. It was be oh. questions for her and then we'll get oh, to discussion. Yeah. Questions. Yes, yes ma'am. No, I don't have any questions. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, so it's late. Will come down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and I'll say I, I can't speak to the platinum jeweler. Uh, it did receive a full variance, but if it's something that the owners, I can ask them if they will consider it. Oh, yeah, that would be uh, great. Absolutely. I will ask them all if they three will on the one sign would be sure. really amazing. But, but my question is, are you, I do have a question for you. Go for it. Are you asking us to vote on um, 
something that gives you six months, or are you saying hold it? Are you oh, both no, no, asking no. for a hold? Well, we have a, we have a pending court case in environmental court right now, and I think what uh, staff and I were talking about <coughs> would be, can, it's, and I guess I don't want to speak for you, but to allow the signs to stay in place no longer than six months. You're asking that for point, a six month sunset on it, is that correct, what you're correct. Okay. Yeah. Sunset six months, yeah. come back with a sign design that will replace a minimum of two, I'll ask for three, and um, be back before this body. So okay. you will get to see it again. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. uh, any other uh, questions? All right, then if somebody could give us a motion to be, uh, approve BOA 21-65 as conditioned by staff, including the six month sunset provision or condition. So moved. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Whitehead, uh, could you give us a roll call, please? Mr. Lazarus? Yes. Mr. Claybrook? Yes. Ms. Dobbs? Yes. Ms. Baker? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, I find that the uh, standards for variances in section 9.2.6 of the uh, are being met. That's six eyes. All right, thank you much. Thank you. All right, Mr. White, have we call the next case for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item number 13 is docket BOA 202166, located at 3294 Poplar. That's at the northwest corner of Poplar and Century. The applicant is BWW 18002 Memphis LLC, represented by Brenda Celebrator Bay. You know, Baser, the use district is the CMU1, commercial mixed use district, and the request is a modification or a correspondence case to docket BOA 1924 to allow site plan changes. All right, is the Avex present? Is there uh, opposition? Got it right here. And then I think we're all really familiar with this case at Century, so if it's okay with Mr. Penzis, we might just go to Ms. Uh, Salmita Baser to tell us why. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brenda Salamito Baser, Salamito Land Planning. The images that you'll see are um, the approved site plan from the previous BOA case to the on site construction. Did you go back to the area? So, we, this is where it is as of today. Um, they went through all the approvals went through all the engineering, and the contractor actually determined that the turning radius as you turn into the tunnel was not a big enough radius to accommodate some of the larger passenger vehicles, vans, and some, some of the longer bed pickup trucks. So, and we know that the, that the regulations as far as the city and their geometry, those are minimum requirements. So you could ask the question, how did we get all the way through the approval process and get through um, our, our reviews and start construction and not necessarily realize that? Well, I think this is to allow for some of the larger passenger vehicles, the vans and you know, pickup trucks that come through. And Jeffrey, if you show the site plan. And so because we did not want to compromise the streetscape, we had a lot of discussion here about the brick wall and the landscaping and visibility, and then the, the private park along the north. Um, so the engineers have come in and widened that radius a little bit, but that um, causes it to encroach just a small amount into the area that was for the park. And I can tell you that area is, the total area is about 71 square feet or so, as I measured it off. And then a, it's probably only actually 50 square feet or more of asphalt. We have kept the same number of landscaping. It's increased a little bit because of the area around there is larger. We've also kept the wrought iron fencing. Everything else is exactly the same. So that is part of the request. We do believe it is a safety issue so that if someone would have gotten stuck in that smaller radius that you see on the left-hand side of your screen, then they would not be able, they would back up and go, I call it ratcheting back and forth, um, as the vehicles tend to do 
um, I was behind a pickup truck in a, a drive-through line, and he was having to do that to back up. Go. So this, we believe, is um, a safety issue. It will prevent people from jumping the curb and or causing any other accidents while they're in the line. So happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Does anybody from the board have any questions for Ms. Solomito? Or will you have? Seven minutes and 20 seconds left. We're going to move on to the opposition. Mr. Lindsay, can you come uh, give your name and address for the record for us? Sure. Attorney Jonathan Lindsay at the Martin Tate Law Firm, 6410 Poplar Avenue, Memphis, in the C3819. And are, are you representing people or are you actually a neighbor? I am representing people. Okay, go ahead then. Yeah. No, I, uh, I represent 16 homeowners who are, uh, live or own homes contiguous or adjacent to this property. Um, could you pull up page five of your staff report? So, uh, as Ms. Salmita said, um, back in early 2019, I represented the same neighbors um, on the same uh, issue or the same site. And we spent about three months negotiating um, with, the, uh, with Ms. Salmito and the owner. And what we reached was um, what was approved in March of 2019, which is what we're here asking to be uh, modified today. Um, and so if you look at the, uh, the that, those are the original lots of this site. And in the, in the 1960s, lot 57 and 58 became a commercial office building. And at that time in the 60s, uh, uh, land planners in the city of Memphis left um, 56, they, they contemplated and put it in the conditions that that would basically be a buffer zone between the commercial space on lots 57 and 58, and then the residential spaces you see north of that. And in 2019, when we were negotiating with uh, the owner, one of the kind of key principles or things, something that was sacrosanct to the neighbors was keeping that 57 year old buffer zone in place. As you can imagine, a coral wash is loud, um, tra lots of traffic. And so Ms. Alamito and the, the applicant at that time agreed that that would uh, remain a open green space to be used only as an open space. Um, and uh, that was approved in the plan. And now uh, come two years later, and we're back at 40 wall for this encroachment upon this green space area. And the neighbors are objecting to that as one, it was not um, part of the negotiations um, in 2019. And they want this, the buffer zone preserved as it was approved in 2019 to reject this uh, current request. Um, UDC 922.6 uh, requires unusual characteristic to be found for a variance request. Um, part of that sub, um, sub six the unusual characteristic cannot be the result of the actions by the applicant. Here, this was approved two years ago, only until they um, pulled permits, started construction, laid the foundation in the, in the uh, uh, and, and I drove by there on the way here, there's a building uh, construction on there. All of that was done um, before this issue was discovered. So it really is an encroachment upon the green space because this issue is not uh, addressed uh, two years ago or a year ago when the construction permit was, was pulled. The neighbors are being penalized for the applicant's failure to pr uh, provide himself with adequate turning radius on this, on this uh, uh, site. So we, the neighbors asked that the 2019 approval site, the approved site plan be maintained and the current re uh, request be denied. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Is there any uh, questions for Mr. Lindsay? Hearing none. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, something the neighbors would um, like for you all to consider would be if you do approve the request today, uh, currently there are five foot shrubbery contemplated between the turning radius and the green space. Neighbors would, if you do, if you do approve the modification, would appreciate uh, higher shrubs being uh, inserted into the site plan just along the encroachment boundary. 
so that there would be higher boundaries between the, the encroachment and the green space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. All right, Ms. Solomito, if you need it, you have nine minutes. Please stand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do understand the neighbor's position. We did spend a great deal of time in 2019 having this discussion and and I don't know of anywhere has any commercial development ever of this size, you know, created and agreed to own and maintain a private park for its neighbors. I don't I don't it is it is something that is incredibly generous and also has, you know, long term ties. And, and benefiting the neighborhood. Uh, we are, we do feel the integrity of the original approval is still intact. They will still be able to enjoy the benefits of the park. They still have all the landscaping, they still have all of the enjoyment and just about the same amount of buffering. It's anticipated that the depth of the area that's required for this larger turning radius be about eight feet deep and probably a little less with the actual asphalt itself. So we feel that this application request is simply for a site plan modification and that our burden of proof was proven and approved in 2019. So this minor modification is just that, a minor modification for safety reasons. This is of no benefit to the owners. It is um, an additional expense for us to come here and ask for this, but we do feel it is a necessary change to insert and ensure the safety of the customers. Um, with regard to Mr. Lindsay's request for the additional landscaping, I'm fine with that. Um, we, we can do something a little bit taller, but our discussions were also about safety inside the park and your ability to, if there were, to create an environment where, you know, shenanigans could happen or people can hide. We had concerns about that at our original um, discussion, but if this body wills it, my client will be fine with it. Okay, are there any questions? I have a question, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Is this a 50 foot wide lot, the, the green space lot? Is it 50 or 60 feet there? Can you go back and take a look? I, I believe it is. The plat might show it, Jeffrey, the actual subdivision plat. Sixty. Sixty. And and how sixty. Sixty. And how how wide is that encroachment area? So it is a rounded it is rounded. The width, yeah, the, uh -huh. of the So the total distance is about eight feet. Um, but the actual asphalt part is a little over five feet or so. questions all right hearing none with some so we can discuss can we get a motion to approve BOA 2021-66 uh, as conditioned by staff second any second is there any discussion anyone want to entertain adding the condition to make the shrubs larger in that portion well, the neighborhood already struggled with building this. So I, I guess my reticence and my concern would be, you know, now you want more. And already the neighborhood struggled with it and encroaching into the playground, the private park, which they were concerned about in the first place. That was one of the largest concerns that they had, aside from just the traffic and, you know, that kind of stuff. But... I don't know. I mean, I I struggle with the decision a little bit because of that. I mean, they were vehemently against this in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I, under, I do understand the safety issue. Sure. I get that as well. All right, other thoughts? 
Jackson? Um, it's, to be honest with you, I don't think that encroachment that they're asking for is unreasonable based on a safety issue. Um, it's a minute, in my mind, it's a minute point. Maybe I'm sure it's not in the neighborhood's mind. It's not. But I do think if they do encroach in it, that the size of the shrubs there could be enlarged because in looking at the landscape plan, they're only going to put in a shrub that's 12 inch to 14 inches in height. And that shrub ultimately gets four foot to six foot in height. So I would ask that, you know, they're getting something, they should give something back. Uh, maybe that shrub should be a 30 to 36 inch height when it goes in. That way it'll be grow a little quicker. I was asking for another, how many feet in person? Three? Was it three feet? Total six to seven. Yeah, seven to eight. Seven, seven feet eight. encroachment into that lot. So since they're asking for seven, I would just say let's bump the size of shrubs up to 30 inch on 36 in that area. All right, uh, Mr. Whitehead, can you add that condition for us? Yes, I'm looking at the existing 13 conditions, and I don't see one that's specific to landscaping. So what we could do is add a 14th condition that says uh, the landscaping shall be um, in compliance with the landscape plan as submitted, period. The landscaping along the northern area of the encroachment subject to BOA 2166 shall be 30 to 36 feet in height when installed, period. Inches. 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 Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we, 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 we all jumped on you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. All right, any other discussion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. Mr. Whitehead, will you give us a roll call, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Claybrook. Yes. Ms. Doss. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Ms. Baker. Yes. Mr. Malazari. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Yes. That's six eyes. All right, approved as condition. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Whitehead, will you call the next case for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Item number 14 is docket BOA 2167, located at 272 South Danny Thomas Boulevard. The uh, applicant is Lowe Property, represented by Brenda Salamina Baser. The use districts are SE and RSD. The use variance, excuse me, the request or use variance is from 721C2 and 722C2 to legitimize a gas station. And I believe what we were waiting on on this one is to have a five votes with you recused. I, I think I'm changing my recusal to, I'm just going to abstain just to, okay. since the vice chair is not here and I don't even know who to run the thing, so. Well, I was going to go straight to my amended condition. I do want you to do. I do want you to do that, but I'm just not going to give any opinion on anything. Is what I'm. Is what I want on the record. So we are striking the second sentence of condition two, and replacing it with all other curb cuts shall be closed within three years of the date of this approval period. Uh, can we get the, the? You know, I think that most of it have read the case. Can we get the can just the conditions up on the screen, Ms. Shubdivis? He says number two. Oh, sorry. So strike all other, well, no. Just add up. Yeah. All other curb cuts shall be closed within three years of the date of this approval. Thank you. Well, so add to the end of the existing second sentence. Okay. Oops, sorry. Different case. Um, all right. Are there any questions regarding that? Uh, Ms. Solomito, do you want to add anything? We're in agreement with the conditions. Thank you. Okay. And are, uh, would someone want to give a motion to approve? What are we on? BOA 2021-67 as conditioned by staff with the uh, new condition being added to the... To the uh, uh, staff report. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. Mr. White, would you give us a roll call, please? Mr. Malazari? Yes. Ms. Baker? 
Yes. Mr. Claybrook? Yes. Ms. Doss? Yes. Mr. Jackson? Yes. We have five eyes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Whitehead, would you call the next case? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Agenda item number 15 is docket BOA 2168, located at 302 and 306 South Lauderdale. The applicant is Patrice Thompson and Craig Sella 401k Trust, represented by Cindy Reeves. The use district is the EMP Industrial District, and the request is a use phrase from 252 to legitimize multifamily housing. All right, is the applicant present? Cindy Reeves, that's our consulting 5909, Shelby Oak Strauss, suite 2. Is there opposition present? There's not, I believe it was uh, Chairman Ms. Baker who had a- Mr. Was, Chairman, oh, okay. I, Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the only thing uh, I want to um, say on this is um, not opposed to the multifamily use, uh, of course, but what, what I disagree with is the way it's worded, use is permitted in a district. We don't really have the authority to permit uses in a district. And so um, the way it should be re worded is to allow multifamily, the use multifamily, not uses permitted in the district. So that's my comment. And I, I think it should be worded like that, the way we approve it. Ms. Baker, may I respond to that, please? Could you repeat so, uh, Mr. Thomas, could you put your conditions up on the screen? That's what I was trying so to So I think what we're saying is instead of saying uh, can, well, we say apartments in condition one, right? Well, those are conclusions. Conditioned oh. and... Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, the request is to allow multifamily housing. That's what the caption says. Ms. Baker, could you, ex like, what part are you reading that you're wanting to change so we can find it and I'll look at it together? Uh, Not against your change, I just want to make sure I understand. Oh, here it is. It's on page 11. Okay. And maybe this it was just worded that way here and I just want to make sure it's not approved that way. Uh, on page 11 at the top, relevant Unified Development Code clauses. And it says section 252 to vary that section to allow apartment uses. Well, that really doesn't say that, does it? I don't know. Maybe I misread it <laughs> and I'm, it's so late now i, I just On the can't 15th find it case you may have uh, well, well here's the good news mr chairman <laughs> yeah right. mr chairman ms reeves wants to modify this anyway so it wasn't going to be on consent anyway okay awesome so uh, okay go ahead go ahead mr uh reese you've already been sworn in so i wanted to modify the site plan this is a this is a, a matter of a court case that was filed and the reason for the uses in the South Downtown Residential District is the vacant lot on the other side. This was a, a home buyer and an heir of the seller. And the heir, uh, the seller passed away and then there was a lawsuit filed because of wrongdoings and warranty deeds and stuff. It's very, very complicated, I'm sorry. Um, the they had finally settled this lawsuit since 2019. They agreed that we would file a board of adjustment to allow his lot to be a legal lot, which would give him a five foot setback from the existing house instead of going through his house. And that her vacant lot would also allow the South Downtown Residential District uses instead of the EMP uses. If we just do the one lot, or uh, just allow the multifamily on the one lot. It doesn't give her any other option except for multifamily or EMP. So we, she wanted some options and it's been a very difficult case to settle, but she wanted the options. Maybe we could just mention what those uses are and we could, and maybe that would be that the vacant lot could be used for these uses. Okay, what are those uses? Um, I will give it to you. 
Ms. Reeves, if I, if I may interrupt, uh -huh. uh, on the uses, we can, uh, I would recommend you, after this meeting, mm -hmm. you make a request for a zoning letter. We will use the zoning letter um, process to articulate the uses permitted so you can enjoy this variance or you can enjoy the EMP district. Now to your first request about the side guard property line setback. Yes. Am I hearing you correct that the property line between these two properties will be shifted to the north so that it is five feet north of the existing building facade? That is correct. And that that requires a variance? That re well, that requir requires a revised site plan. It requires a revised site plan? Yes, sir. We can do that administratively. But my condition says that I can't deviate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it says any deviation may be reviewed by the zoning administrator. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, <laughs> how about a new condition two that says, uh, or uh, tag on to the existing condition that says the property line may be shifted so it does not cross through the existing building. So then that gives you security into the future. Five feet. And to allow a five foot setback. Okay, we'll say um, that in a new added on condition number one, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Whitehead, I, I might have not heard you right on this, but uh, you seem to be suggesting that she could go back and forth between the variance and also pick some other uses in the zoning and she can have them all at the same time. That's not right. That's not what you meant to say, right? Uh, she could either enjoy this variance for apartments or go to the EMP zoning. Right. right. She has, she she at, right now she's at that point when she gets this she can pick one or the other, but she can't go back and forth. Correct. Okay. But I can't do single family either or a duplex. I'm stuck with just multifamily there. We make an amendment to just allow residential uses or take apartment out of it. We just so residential uses be a single family. Or multifamily. Yes. Multifamily. They'll just. That would be. That would. That would see our needs. Thank you. Any other questions? Concerns with that? Uh, Mr. Ryder, do you want to restate the uh, condition for us real quick? I didn't, uh, Mr. Thomas, I didn't print a copy of this one. I think in the future we're going to print copies of all staff reports. <laughs> <laughs> it's right behind you. He's handing it to you. Okay. So uh, any changes, so we have the existing condition number one. Um, and tagged on to that, we're going to add that the property line may be shifted so it is not crisscrossing the building and be shifted in such a way that it could be five feet north of the existing building. And then what was just requested was to not only allow multifamily uses, but other residential uses as well. Yes, sir. Okay. Are there any questions, concerns at this time? All right. Um, then if somebody would give us a motion to approve BOA 2021-68 uh, as conditioned by staff. So move. Second. Is there any discussion? I'm going to. Mr. Weiner, would you give us a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Baker. Yes. Ms. Doss. Yes. Mr. Malazri. Yes. Mr. Jackson. Yes. Mr. Claybrook. Yes. Mr. Rainey. Yes. Six eyes. All right. Thank you. And then Mr. White, have you call our last case for us? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Number 16 is a petition for rehearing. It's docket BOA 2143, located at 4918 William Arnold Road. The, app, the petitioner is Rose McCallum. The use district is RW, and the request is a rehearing uh, for next month of the May 26th, last month's approval of a use variance from 252 to allow inpatient care services at an existing outpatient rehabilitation clinic and counseling center. And Mr. Chairman, uh, if, as you may be aware, under our rules, you uh, have reviewed on the record the petition itself. You may entertain oral argument during this request, uh, uh, but you don't have to. Okay. 
Thank you very much. It, now, first, I think I would ask the board, does anybody want to hear oral argument on this case or just discuss and vote? I'm not seeing anyone asking for oral argument. So therefore, I'd want a motion to approve the request for rehearing. So moved. Second. Moved and second. Is there any discussion? They are asking for, uh, they're saying the Zoom call didn't sufficiently give ability uh, for some, you know, conversation about what was going on, so they'd like to have it reheard. Also, you know, maybe change some parking situation to alleviate some things by allowing parking in the back. Didn't we hold this initially a month and they were, they met with Cindy, the adjacent property owners? So we held it, the the last meeting we had via conference call, Zoom call, whatever you want to. Yeah. They were able to meet and then they were here in person last night. Well, minus the public. Yeah. I don't know if they met with her. Right. So the, the question is, do we want, do we really want to hear it again? Opportunities were given at that time. Issued a sunset clause on it on the correct, yeah. Any other comments? Two or three years, or no, I think it was three years, same was three years because they were looking for another building, I think. If memory yeah. serves me correct, do you remember, uh, Mr. Whitehead? Did we land on three years or did we land on or did we actually lower it? I remember two, I thought it was that's what, two. That's what I was kind of thinking. Yeah. It went down two to two, years. I think I was like pushing for three. <laughs> it went to two. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, any other comments? And no one wants to hear from you. Mr. Whitehead, uh, could you give us a roll call vote on the rehearing? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Baker? No. Uh, no, ma'am. No. Uh, Mr. Claybrook? No. Ms. Doss? No. Mr. Jackson? No. Mr. Melanger? No. And Mr. Chairman? Uh, no. That's six nays. The rehearing fails. Uh, you do have recourse if you don't like our decision. Like it can be a, it can be appealed to like Chancery Court, but based on the multiple times we heard it, we decided not to hear it. But thank you for coming down. Sorry you had to wait forever today to, to be heard, uh, but not heard. Aren't you? Uh, Mr. Whitehead, do we have any announcements? No, sir. All right, I have one. We were having our Christmas in June party. That has been postponed to our <laughs> meeting. It will now be Christmas in July. Uh, details will follow. With that, we're adjourned.